I usually start these kind of videos right away, but this time it's more of a special occasion. Instead of using an iceberg chart like usual, I use concept art of Kid Icarus Uprising, and I turn it into Sky World into Underworld chart, since it makes a lot more sense, if you really think about it. So anyway, what is up guys? It's your boy, Mr. AIG. Back at it again with another iceberg video, or in this case, Sky World to Underworld chart. Sorry to keep you guys waiting. Let's start off with the video with the first layer, that being Sky World. Kid Icarus was released on the Famicom Disk System in Japan on December 19, 1986. It was later released in Europe on February 15, 1987, and later released in North America on July 1, 1987. This was Pit's first adventure on saving Sky World and saving the goddess Palutena from Medusa. Kid Icarus Missing Monsters was released on the Game Boy in North America on November 5, 1981. It was later released in Europe on May 21, 1982. Despite being made in Japan, it didn't get a Japanese release up until February 8, 2012 on 3DS. If you want to know what the story is about in Missing Monsters, you gotta wait until the second layer. Sorry about that. Kid Icarus Uprising was a long-awaited sequel after 25 years since the original Kid Icarus. It was released on the Nintendo 3DS during the month of March. Uprising's story is about when Medusa gets resurrected again and Palutena sends Pit in order to stop her once again. I'm gonna let you guys know right now, there's gonna be some spoilers. If you haven't played the game, do it now. If you have the game and you finished it, very good. Good. You guys can stay. But if you haven't, click off this video right now and come back later. But, but Mr. AIG, I don't want to pay it for a physical copy. Who said that you need to buy a physical copy? They're expensive as hell. Get yourself a used 3DS and, um, um, what was it? What was it? Um, and just download it digitally and do it quick. Since Nintendo's got to shut down the 3DS and Wii U eShop. You have March of 2023. If you don't have this game or a 3DS, go buy it now. Go! Go buy it now! Go! Did you just say no? Then you could go suck on my income book em. Yes, I know that's Bandicoot related, but still, I don't care. Go buy it. Once again, go! A remake of the original Kid Icarus was released on the Nintendo 3DS eShop as part of the 3DS Classic series. The game itself is based on a Famicom disc version. It includes three save files and a more enhanced music and sound effects. Every single level in the game now has a background instead of the empty black background that was found in the original version. There are three in-game options. First option allows you to adjust the controls, the second option allows you to adjust the 3D effect, and the last option lets you watch the credits. Pause menu now includes two options, continue or end. In my honest opinion, this is probably the definitive version of the game. If you wait for a few minutes after the ending credits, Hades will start talking. Well, I must say I am impressed. Such a teeny little angel defeating such a big bad god of the underworld. Why pity? That must make you the most powerful Nintendo character of all time. I'm actually rather proud of you. 8-Bit Pit would have never made it this far. Boss battle mode for you. So, here's to Kid Icarus Uprising, my new favorite game of all time. Thanks for playing. Hades out! Even to this day, many players, including myself, took this to heart. And we're still waiting for a sequel or a remake. We know that this game came out in March of 2012. And what Hades said was true or not. We have to wait up until March of 2037. The current year right now is 2022. Only 15 more freaking years to go. That's if we're still alive. Or not. I mean, I hope I'm alive. Same thing goes for all of y'all. Stay strong, Kid Icarus fans. Stay strong. Just like Hades says, Boss Rush mode is now unlocked after you beat all the chapters in story mode. Despite facing each boss again in this mode, Hades is not in it. You can only face him again if you replay chapter 25. Not sure why he was excluded. No, seriously, it's kind of weird. You can actually move the menu icons whenever you want, but afterwards it will go back to the original spot. Together mode was a local and online multiplayer section of the game. It consists of two modes. Light vs. Dark and Free For All. In Light vs. Dark, the players are randomly selected in Team Light or Team Dark. Each team must defeat each other's team's health bar and defeat their angels to win within a certain time limit. The last player killed in battle will either become Pit or Dark Pit, depending on the team they're on. Free For All is a six-way point match. Whoever has the most kill points wins. Yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it. As of right now recording this, Together Mode is still act up and running as of recording this video. These two modes are fun as hell. Not to toot my own horn, but I'm pretty good at it. Like, MVP good. If you so happen to come across me online, you stand no chance. You can't stop it with my Pandoria claws. So anyway, if you still want to play this game, now is the time to play together mode. Because who knows when Nintendo might shut it down. After you beat chapter 21, if you go back to the main menu, select on options, then other, then select hidden options. You can now select different menu options between Palutena or Viridi in solo mode. And let's be honest, Viridi has the better menu option. I mean, come on, listen to the music. And don't get me started on the scenery. It looks so damn beautiful. The street pass feature allowed players to send gems that contains weapons to other players. 
you can use these gems to create more better weapons or convert them into hearts. I can't really show off this feature due to the fact, well, I don't know anybody that has this game personally. So sorry about that. It's no secret that the Kid Icarus series had some history with Super Smash Brothers. There's Pit's trophy from Melee. Pit was later playable in Brawl. Alongside with him includes music and a stage. Palatina and Dark Pit later joining Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS, and so much content from the Kid Icarus series, even up to the latest game, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. They even name dropped Super Smash Bros. in one of their conversations. Wait, hold it to run. That move feels so familiar. I think they used it in that one series, Super Bash Sisters. You mean Super Smash Bros.? Uh, I don't think it was that. It's definitely that. Yeah, I've been using them for a long time. They're well suited for ranged attacks and they split into blades for close combat. They're very well rounded weapons. Oh, I know. I used them in the last brawl. Wow. How horrible were you hurt? No way, it was a smash. I just can't imagine you in a melee. That's because I wasn't. The original Kid Icarus for the NES had a password system that allows players to progress in the game where the player can resume where they left off. This was only implemented for the NES due to the lack of a save system, unlike in the Famicom Disk version, in which it had a save system. The amount of times the fourth wall was broken in Uprising is too damn high. So here's a montage of it. Sorry if I miss any. If you don't want to watch this section of the video, skip to this timestamp on screen. Yes, but your next mission can't wait. You must defeat Dark Lord Gaul. <laughs> Dark Lord? Seriously? Ever the Dark Lord thing been done to death already? He's earned it. He's working for Medusa. Her forces are coming from his castle. A human army is going to fight him, but they don't stand a chance. So what you're saying is we need a brave hero to face a Dark Lord? I suppose it is an old story. But don't forget, this is the underworld army we're dealing with. And anybody with the title Dark Lord won't be some low-level minion. So what are we talking about? Mini boss? to refocus our efforts on Medusa, for today's target is Tanatos, god of death. Tanatos? You mean the Tanatos? Wait, who's Tanatos again? Back in the 80s, Tanatos took the form of a snake on Medusa's head. He's quite the chameleon, you see, and that was his first look back then. Great fashion sense. But as god of death, he must be a big deal in the underworld army. The underworld. Finally made it. In your past adventures, the underworld was where you died the most, right? Oh, absolutely. The difficulty level was just brutal. I'll brace for the worst. Twin bellows! Here, boy! Old Pit's gonna teach you even more new tricks! And if you're good, I'll take you for a walk! And give you a bath! And a treat! We're gonna rack up some serious Nintendo's trainer points together! Focus, kid. We did it! We really did it! 
Congratulations! I know it wasn't always easy. Oh, but it was so worth it. With the world at peace again, even the sun feels warmer. Oh, you're so cute, Pit. <laughs> <laughs> now wait, wait just, just a second. second. Huh? Did you hear something? I said, I said wait, wait just, just a, a second. second. Got to be hearing things. <laughs> Hades? Who's Hades? The true master of the underworld. Sorry to keep you waiting, but now that I'm here, let's get this party started. Well, Oops. Yes, we've been practicing this routine all week. Attacking Strider and straight on won't do much damage. Swing around and go attack him from behind. Do this, keep your reticle fixed. Get up close and dash left or right. Uh, now just check the how to play movies for details. Then destroy the core. Huh. It's like a shooting game. I can almost feel the controller in my hands. There's all this activity here, but no actual light. It's pretty creepy. At this point, I'd expect a boss or something. And he'd be like, Mwahaha! I've been waiting for you, bitch! Aw, oh, poor Pits. Are you feeling lonely? You're the only member of Palatina's army who can carry his own weight. Don't even give me... Those arm hey, are looking to just kick it out! Check out the gaming ID! Resort treasures must be inside! Yeah. Then your video game is free! Not so fast! This is really held up well! Remember the name of this chapter? It is less pixelated uh, than I remember. Isn't it the one trial or something? You're a couple trials short there, sonny. Power pieces, huh? Cool! Looks like all that Dr. Mario was about to pay off! Oh, jeez. She was a huge pain 25 years ago. That was only in two dimensions. Hey, look! Check it out! The three sacred treasures must be inside. Hmm. The box is really held up well. It is less pixelated than I remember. In the English version of Kid Icarus Uprising, in Chapter 17, while Pitt was falling to his death, he screams this. I never learned how to read! <laughs> this was later reused in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate during his Star KO. AR cards were heavily promoted alongside with the release of Kid Icarus Uprising. You can now view a 3D model of the card, and doing this will allow you to obtain idols and hearts. 3DS camera can only scan 3 AR cards at a time. In this mode, you're allowed to take pictures and even battle them. Since these AR cards are kind of hard to find, unless you buy it from someone online, here's on how I did it. Okay, the way I did it, I just looked up the AR cards on my phone and just scanned it. The only Uprising AR card in which I have is the one I got from Game Informer back then. In Chapter 17, when Pyron gets possessed by the Arum Brain, and before facing him, by using a binary code generator, it translates to kill. In Street Pass Me Plaza, one of the mini games was called Puzzle Swap. In order to play this game, the player must collect puzzle pieces by either passing by other 3DS owners or by using play coins. It so happens that one of the puzzle panels was from Kid Icarus Uprising. This was used in order to promote the game. There's a Kid Icarus theme on a 3DS eShop. The theme itself includes sprites from the game and as well as some of the sound effects. Eventually, the 3DS eShop might go down soon. So if you have a 3DS and you want to buy this, because obviously they're not gonna put this theme on the Switch, and we still haven't got any themes. I will never understand Nintendo sometimes. If you go to settings, go to data management and click on extra data, locate your Kid Icarus Uprising data file, and you'll notice that Pit is holding a letter. This icon is only seen in the extra data, quite different from the usual icon. After you lose all your health, a cauldron will spell out hearts. Immediately afterwards, hold down the circle pad and you'll see an Easter egg. You'll see a bunch of hearts and a reaper. You can actually zoom in and move the camera around during cutscenes. You can do this by pressing the A button to zoom in and use the circle pad to move the camera around. Does anybody remember the Circle Pad Pro? 
Yeah, me neither. I totally forgot about it. It was used for the original 3DS and later redesigned for the 3DS XL. The Circle Pad Pro includes a second slider pad and three shoulder buttons. This gives the 3DS a console-like controller feel to it. It was mostly used for RPGs and third-person shooter games, just like Kid Icarus Uprising. If you have a physical copy of Uprising, there's actually a reversible box art. Well, not really a reversible box art, more like artwork of the character's in-game face expressions. The names of the towns, believe it or not, have names, and very crappy names at best. The name of the town in the first chapter is called That First Town. The name of the second town in chapter 3 is called Dab Burning Town. In chapter 19, the name of this town is called Decimated Town. The only town that doesn't have a name was seen in chapter 25. Look, I know it is what it is, but I kind of wish these towns actually have names. You know, like real names? Because it's kind of weird calling it by those names. If you tap on a cauldron so many times, it will eventually turn away from the bottom screen. If you continue to tap on a cauldron and wait for a few seconds, the cauldron will move slightly. Afterwards, if you tap on a cauldron again, it will go back facing away from the screen. Once you're done tapping the bottom screen completely, the expression on the cauldron's face will be different just for a few seconds. In Super Smash Bros. Brawl and Super Smash Bros. for Wii U, there were these things called masterpieces. These were time-limited trials of certain Nintendo games, and one of them was Kid Icarus. Palatina's guidance was something similar to Snake's Codec and Super Smash Bros. Brawl, basically where characters from the Kid Icarus series, like Pit, Palatina, and sometimes Viridi and Dark Pit, talk about specific characters on the battlefield. In order to activate this, player must be Pit, and the stage must be Palatina's temple. Quickly and gently press the down directional button on the controller. If done correctly, Pit will drop down into a praying position, and then he will get back on his Speed. You can only do this once per fight. Believe it or not, Super Smash Bros. actually expands the lore of Kid Icarus. According to the total description for Phosphora in Super Smash Bros. for 3DS, it states that she's not a good singer. Still on the same topic as the 3DS trophies, in the UK version, it states that the Underworld Army actually tried to convince Arlong to join their side. The trophy description for Palutena's bow, while Palutena was making the bow herself, apparently one night, the moon's light form a beam and fell upon the bow, blessing it with power. It's quite odd, because you can actually make Palutena's bow in Uprising without using the power of the moon or you can just buy from Palutena. On the other note, according to Palutena's guidance on Dark Pit, it states that Dark Pit now joined Viridi's army, and that the Lightning Chariot is now hers. That is a load of BS. The Chariot Master basically said that Pit was the rightful owner. You're telling me that she has it now. Come on, Pit. What are you doing? Get your Chariot back. In North America, there were the CGI commercials promoting Kid Icarus Uprising. In one of those commercials, it included Pit, Twin Bellows, and Medusa. As we can see here, Pit is actually holding a fortune bow. When Pit was fighting Twin Bellows, it looks like he was using the Samurai Blade. When Pit was fighting Medusa, as you can see closely, he has the helmet, the bow, the wings of Pegasus, the arrows of light, and a mirror shield. But for some reason, he's not wearing his armor. I'm not surprised nobody has talked about this. In the other North America commercial, it showed off the online multiplayer. In one of the Japanese commercials, there was a glimpse of what looks like a live-action Medusa but it was only her shadow. This could be a reference to the first Kid Icarus commercial in Japan, in which they actually use a live-action Medusa to do so. But this could be a coincidence. Maybe or maybe not. There were a bunch of alternate paths and cutscenes in Uprising. I hope I managed to get all of them. Sorry if I miss any. Yeah, a treasure box! That's clearly a trap. Think about it. Who would leave treasure just lying around outside? for deployment. Once preparations are complete, I will launch an attack. You don't have to do that. Let me handle it. Okay, charging complete. The sacred goddess clobber laser is now ready for deployment. Wait, I thought it was a glam- You could have obliterated me! Oh, do you think I overdid it? Two of the heads got away. Hurry, after them! You're all alone. Whatever. I don't like those guys anyway. And that's that. Not so fast. Huge draw heads can live without a body. You better follow them. And that's that. Not so fast. Huge draw heads can live without a body. You better follow them. Oh, I'm the only one left. Actually, I'd say you're the only one right. <laughs> Get it? Right? No. That I feel great losing all that dead weight. I'm readying my Palutena Glam Blaster for deployment. Once preparations are complete, I'm
And that's that. Not so fast. Hue draw heads can live without a body. You better follow them. Uh, what just happened? Do you like the gift? It's my patented monster pheromone. Monsters just love the smell of it. And now it's all over you. What? Are you trying to kill me? Oh, my goodness. What's going on? Luckily, the pheromone only attracted one of the heads. I was wondering what you would have done if both of them had shown up. Can you still went through with it? I would have been finished for sure! Despite my winsomeness and equanimity, I do have a strong streak of rascality. I don't even know what that means! I have enough to resist you! You smell too good! Ew! Back off! But I just want to cuddle you! What just happened? Do you like the gift? It's my patented monster pheromone. Monsters just love the smell of it. And now it's all over you. What? Are you trying to kill me? Why, hello, My brothers. Yep, sure did. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Now I'm finally free. No, I'm too pretty to die. And there you have it. Victorious. Good work. Let's be on our way. So you finished off the others, eh? You know it! Then you've saved the best for last. Let's get down to business! Look how far you've come, Pit. I'm proud of you. Huh. You don't usually meet such nice bosses. Let's get you back. Well, so nice to see you again. You won't feel that way for long. <laughs> That's big talk, little fire. Before I die, I just want to say. And that's the end of him. I wonder what he was going to say. Um, I'm 
Two at the end of a trail. The area by the fountain seems like a good place to start looking. The two is on top of the mountain up ahead. How do you get up there? I don't know, but he's targeting you with a sniping staff head. Ah. <laughs> Little pest. Trying to escape again? You only need to defeat him one more time. This must have been a temple. Humans turn to the gods in times of need, and forget them in times of prosperity. They really are a fickle bunch. Hey there, pit stain. You know I could call you the same thing, right? Away. It's okay, he couldn't have gone far. Pit 2 is at the altar on the hill. It's visible from the fountain. Ha! Found you! Finding me is the easy part. Little pest. Trying to escape again? Uh, I'm all set. Are you ready for the final battle, Pit? It's now or never. Oh! You won't be using the three sacred treasures? The sacred treasures look cool, but I'm going with my weapon of choice. Just in case, though, let's take the Pegasus Wings, too. Equipped! Are you ready for the final battle, Pit? It's now or never. For this final battle, you're equipped with the three sacred treasures. Using the Pegasus Wings and Power of Flight at the same time seems like over. Who knows how reliable the Pegasus Wings are after all this time. I've turned them off. Understood. We're right to go directly to the volcano. We're left to go through the tunnel. Going to cut straight through, are you? How hot can it be? Whoa. Heat. If it weren't for my power of cooling, you'd be burned to a crisp by now. I sometimes forget just how flammable humans and angels are. Oh! That was a close one. Good thing you didn't go through that tunnel. Yeah, that would have been bad. Tunnel. I hope it's cooler in there. Levels rising in here. Hopefully, it won't rise too fast. Ah, there's nowhere to go. Stay calm, Pit. Stay calm? You're not the one who's about to get steamed like a dumpling. I said stay calm. That 
That's a relief. Pit, behind you! Too close for comfort. No need to get all hot under the collar, though, right? You just couldn't resist, could you? The wish seed looks real enough. The Phoenix! He's not going to let you go without a fight. Quickly, get destroy the wish seed! Burn it! Wait! Get away! just blew up! Well, that proves it's a fake! Oh, please. The beacon tells the humans of the Phoenix's defeat, and that will make them think that someone has taken the Wish Seed. Now, I'll just give them a little nudge. People of the world, the Wish Seed has been liberated! This is your chance to fulfill your wildest dreams! All you have to do is conquer anyone in your way! The people will not be so easily deceived! I wish that were true, but I foresee major bloodshed. This is all my fault. shows the world that the phoenix has been defeated which will only make the humans believe that someone has taken the wish seed now i'll just give them a little nudge people of the world the wish seed has been liberated this is your chance to fulfill your wildest dreams all you have to do is conquer anyone in your way the people will not be so easily deceived i wish that were true but i foresee major bloodshed this is all my fault Wonderful. Hurry, Pit, you're running out of time. You're down to the wire. Ah, uh, no! We were too slow. There's a jump up ahead. I can't believe this thing actually fits inside the arm high. It is quite expansive. Alright! So many enemies! The forces of nature? Don't get the wrong idea, Pit. I'm not here to help you. It's just in my best interest to keep you alive for now. Aw, it looks like Little Miss Cactus has a soft spot for Pit. Uh, really? Because I don't think you're all that bad either.
I done? I won't be needing the three sacred treasures. Equip again! Ooh, do I spy with my little eye the three sacred treasures? Even your darkness can't hide from the light! Now, isn't that just... Precious! No, that felt good. Not the three sacred treasures! What? No! You're not quite so tough now, are you? I won't be needing the three sacred treasures. Oh, not bad, Pity Pat. That's right! You better watch yourself! Now, isn't that just... Precious! No, that felt good. Are you okay there, Pit? Hades has got some raunchy breath. That's really the least of your concerns. Huh? Having fun, Pity Pat. Pity Pat, you're looking mighty tasty down the hatch! No, 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 no! Get out of the pit! You must overcome all three. And where do you think you're headed, Sonny? You're not snooping, are you, Pit? Well, excuse me. Since when is it a crime to explore a level? Miss me! Kit Icarus characters are based on Greek mythology and a little bit of Roman mythology. For example, Halatana is based on Athena, Hades and Medusa are based on the same name and counterpart of some way, and so on and so on. You get the point. On the topic of names, the names of the map in the online multiplayer have names. Yeah, apparently these maps have names, in which I did not know about up until now. Here are the names of the online multiplayer maps. Windy Wasteland, Lava Basin, Starlight Observatory, Ancient Fortress, Twilight Stratosphere, Desert Tomb, Rail Temple, Cave of Spirits, Forgotten City, Spiral Tower, Large Arena, and Small Arena. Hey, out of curiosity, I'm not sure it's just me or not, but has anybody ever played online in one of the maps is Large Arena and Small Arena? Am I the only one who never encountered playing in Large Arena and Small Arena? Because I played in every single online multiplayer map, except for those two. Is it considered rare or something? I never once played in those maps before. If you guys played in those maps before, let me know, because I'm actually curious of what was it like. 
You see these laurels on screen? These green laurels are only obtained by completing each chapter. To get the golden laurels, you have to collect the treasure boxes in the intensity gates and zodiac chambers, only if it's found in that chapter. Chapters 9, 11, 17, 21, 22, and 25 are the only chapters that will give you a golden laurel if you complete those chapters, since those chapters have no zodiac chambers or intensity gates. If you don't know by now, Epic Games send out their survey to their player base with a list of characters that people might want to see in Fortnite. Pitt's name was listed in one of the Fortnite surveys. Even though he was one of the choices, I don't think Pitt will be joining Fortnite or hitting the gritty anytime soon. Why you may ask? Well, I do remember that a Metro collaboration was supposed to happen, but they couldn't get permission from Nintendo. It's most likely that Nintendo didn't want Samus to appear on different consoles and PC. I mean, kind of a shame, really. It would have been awesome to see Samus and Pit in Fortnite. And to be honest, I can see Pitt and Jonesy being best buddies if the collaboration happened. If I had to guess, maybe the collaboration would have involved Medusa or Hades in some way. And I guess the skins could be Pitt, Dark Pitt, perhaps Palutena. Perhaps the weapon of choice would have been the Three Sacred Treasures as that special weapon collaboration choice. Huh, I kind of wish this collaboration happened. Oh, you know, Nintendo, being strict as usual. Offering to the goddess. There were so many rumors about this feature. The whole rumor was that if you keep on offering a bunch of hearts to either Palutena or Veridi, there's a chance that an increase of shop sales, better items, new dialogue, increase the chance of getting new idols, and better weapons with better equalities during high intensities. There's also another rumor that if you give over 100,000 hearts, you'll get the Palutena blade. But at the end of the day, none of these rumors were true. Even Sakurai said that you get nothing out of it. It was just there for fun, to give players something to do. On April 1st, 2012, Sakurai stated on his official Twitter, the official age is converted into human years. Pitt is 13 years old, Palutena is 22, Veridi is 8, and Phosphorus is either 16 or 17. And as for the other characters, we don't know. Well, that's the end of the first layer. Now moving on to the second layer. In the instruction manual of Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters, it states that when Pit gets all three sacred treasures, he turns into Amazing Pit. This is the only time in which they actually gave him a proper form name, and this was never mentioned ever again. I'm kind of glad he did, because really? Amazing Pit? That's the name you're going to go with? You could call it Saint Pit or Super Saint Pit. Super Angel Saint Pit. There we go. Much better. If you look back in the box art for the original Kid Icarus, it states that there's a two-player mode. It's quite odd because there never was a two-player mode. Not only that, if you look in the front box art for Kid Icarus, there's two enemies that never appeared in the game. If you look in the bottom left corner, you'll notice this adventure series icon. This icon only showed up for two games, Metroid and Kid Icarus. Besides those two, none of the other NES games have this icon. Also, one more thing. What the hell is up with Pit's face? No, seriously, look at it. It looks like someone did it in MS Paint. Kid Icarus Uprising is the only game within the franchise that doesn't have a map system. In order to use the map system in the first two games, you have to be within the fortress. Within the fortress, you have to find the following three items. A check sheet, it gives you the map of the entire area. The pencil will indicate what rooms you have been, and the flame torch will help you indicate on where you are. Like I said before, Kid Icarus Uprising has no map system. The only thing close to it is the green arrows, or check marks, or whatever you want to call it. Orcos was the main antagonist and the final boss of Kid Icarus Missing Monsters. He was based on the Roman god Orcus, the Roman god of the underworld. In the game, he has two phases. In phase one, he shoots fireballs and charges at you, and in phase two, he becomes a giant. He will try to stomp you, shoot fireballs at you, and summon bats. But in the end, he gets defeated. Orcos only shows up for this game, and never again. Not even one mention in Uprising. The three second treasure consists of the following items. The Wings of Pegasus, the light arrow, or arrows of light, whatever you want to call it, and the mirror shield. In Myths and Monsters, it was different. It consists of the wings of Pegasus, the light arrow, and the silver armor. He does wear the armor in the original game and in Uprising, but it was never part of it. In Uprising, they went back to the original three sacred treasures, just like in the first game. Despite Myths and Monsters being the second game in the series, the characters and the enemies first introduced for the game never appeared in Uprising. Not even one mention or cameo. Despite Myths and Monsters being the second game in the series, it was never released in Japan. Up until February 8, 2012. 12. This could mean two things. One, this game is no longer canon, or two, this might sound crazy and stupid, but could this game take place after Uprising? Remember in Chapter 23 when Hades used a powerful blow to get rid of the three sacred treasures from Pit? And in Chapter 24, Palutena even states that the three sacred treasures were out of commission. Perhaps, maybe, after the events of Uprising, Palutena asked Lord Dentos to make a new three sacred treasures, that being the one for Mists and Monsters. To know if this game is still canon, the only piece of evidence to know if this game is still canon is that the UK website for Kid Icarus Uprising that states that Mips and Monsters is still the second game in the series. But then again, my theory could be wrong. Pit does look a little bit younger in Mimps and Monsters, unless they want to wreck on it. But who knows? 
huts or underworld enemies that look like Pit and wear a helmet similar to Pit when he wears his silver armor. Their appearance look awfully similar to the fighters from Kid Icarus Uprising and could be one of the inspiration for the creation of Dark Pit. Speaking of which... In Super Smash Bros. Brawl, one of Pit's alternate attires was a black attire, or in which Sakurai likes to call it, the Fallen Angel Colors. This might also predate Dark Pit's appearance before he debuted in Uprising. The story of the original Kid Icarus is based on the story of Perseus. Long story short, it all started when Polydectes fell in love with Dende. Perseus didn't believe that Polydectes was worthy enough to marry her. Polydectes held a huge banquet where guests were expected to bring gifts. He requested that every single guest must bring a horse, but Perseus didn't have a horse, so he asked Polydectes to name a gift that he cannot refuse. He then told Perseus to bring the head of Medusa. And so, that's where Perseus' adventure began. He had the help of Athena's guidance, in which he told Perseus to find Hesperides, who were given weapons to defeat Gorgons, one of them being Medusa. The origin of Pit's name came from the Japanese word Cupito. The translation for this in English is Cupid. You can obviously see why. Both of them are angels, and they use bow and arrows. And yeah, that's, um, kind of it. In a game developer's conference in 2008, Masahiro Sakurai stated that Pit's redesign was inspired by Link from The Legend of Zelda. A 2D cartoonist Pit redesign was considered for Brawl, but it was dropped entirely. If I had to guess, it might have been the 2D cartoonist Pit's trophy from Melee. In one of Sakurai's picks of the day for Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS, we got a glimpse of the reset bomb forest and Viridi in the background. If you look very closely, Viridi's crown had two red roses on it. This was not found in the final version. In the final version of the game, she has the same crown that she wore an uprising. During the boss fight against Dark Lord Gallo in Chapter 2, if you wait long enough, it will reveal that Dark Lord Gallo and Magmus used to work together as mercenaries. If you wait even longer, it will reveal that Magmus at one point was a dad. But Gallo's heart was weak, and he couldn't resist the temptation of the underworld. Seeing them fighting, it's hard to believe they were ever friends. Magnus only knows one way to fight, ferociously. Perhaps his fire is fueled by the child he lost to underworld troops. I had no idea. That's so sad. You and your mouth. I almost am sure it's a joke. But not quite. I'll rip this angel to shreds first, then I'll take care of you. There's a chance that different enemies from different factions will start attacking and killing each other. This could be shown in chapters 8 and 12, but it's gonna be a while. Unless you want to sit back and relax and watch them kill each other, if that's your style. There are two enemies in Uprising that were called Collins and Phil. The enemy Phil used to be called EOI in the NES version of Kid Icarus. Outside of Japan, this was changed to the right translation in Uprising. The names of these two enemies are actually a reference to the famous singer, Phil Collins. The three sacred treasures are not based on Greek mythology, but instead, they're based on Japanese mythology, or the Imperial Regalia of Japan. It consists of three items. First being a sword called Kusanage no Suguri. It was originally called Amano Marakomo no Surugi. The second item being a mirror called Yata no Kagami. Third and last item is a jewel called Yakasani no Makatama. Each of these three items symbolize virtues in some way. The sword supposed to represent valor, being courage. The mirror represents wisdom, and the jewel represents benevolence. The whereabouts of the real-life three sacred treasures are still unknown. They're actually not supposed to be seen by the public eye. The only time they actually do appear is in private ceremonies. And when I meant by appearing in the ceremonies, I meant that they're still in the box. Not even people in the private ceremonies are not allowed to open the boxes. If the items are not used in ceremonies, they're supposedly located in private areas in Japan. Even though we don't know the exact location of the three sacred treasures, it's said that the sword is located at a Suda shrine in Nagoya. The jewel is supposedly located at the three palace sanctuaries and the imperial palace in in Tokyo. The mirror is supposedly located at the Ice Grand Shrine in Mie Prefecture. I am so sorry if I pronounced these words wrong. Oh boy, I need a drink after that. Hold on, give me, give me one sec. <sighs> okay, okay, much better. Where was I? Oh, right. Besides Super Smash Brothers and Puzzle Swap, Palutena, Dark Pit, and mostly Pit had made appearances, cameos, and references in other Nintendo games. Pit made an appearance in Nintendo Tetris, F1 Race, NES Remix 2, and Ultimate NES Remix. Palutena, Dark Pit, and Pit were a reference in Yoshi Woolly World as inspired costumes. And the same thing goes for Super Mario Maker. Pit's name was actually referenced in another Nintendo game. His name was one of the suggestions in Glories of Hercules. I stumbled upon a website called Kid Icarus Shrine. It details all the passwords for the original Kid Icarus. I tried every single password in the Switch version. And to my surprise, and quite of a shock really, none of them work. 
No, seriously, none of them actually work. After doing some more research, it turns out that these original passwords that was found in the NES version don't actually work in any of the re-releases of the game. From the virtual console, re remember that? Remember, remember when Nintendo used to have a virtual console? Okay, anyway, um, from the virtual console and onwards, the new passwords are actually based on the Wii version, not the original NES version. So I went to IGN's website and there it was, passwords for the Wii version. And I test the passwords out and it actually work. If you don't believe me, try it out yourself. But I kind of still wonder why they decided to do this. You could say it could be the save states, but why still change the passwords? Like, it doesn't make any sense. If you have a 3DS, right before you boot up Kid Icarus Uprising, blow on the 3DS mic, and you will see Pit Spin. I know a lot of you guys are gonna say, but you can do that for every single game. And the application's on the 3DS, but come on. Look at him. Look at him spin. I just like it when he spins, so let me just look at it. Remember when Hades said that he wants to bring back the little girl's parents in Chapter 10? So much for asking. I just... You see this poor child? Both of her parents are dead. There was an unfortunate accident. If you know what I mean. You mean you murdered them? It was a simple case of distracted chariot driving. I shouldn't have been doing my hair. Anyway, I was hoping to use the wish seed to bring back the parents. Can you think of anything more joyous than a family reunion? Then after that, they'd strike it rich. Like, rolling in dough, Rich. And then, we'd slap crowns on all of them and make them royalty. And that's the general gist of my wish. Pretty noble, and not at all evil, right? Many people speculated that the little girl in chapter 18 is the same girl that he mentioned in chapter 10. I, I can see why though, because they do look similar. Is this actually true? We don't know. The Centurion's strong arms have a tattoo of Palutena on their left arm. It's based on Palutena's original design from the first game. Not only this could be found in their artwork, this could be found in game. This same tattoo of Palutena can also be seen in game. When a Centurion strong arm throws the 100 pound dumbbell, if you look very closely, you can see a picture of Palutena on it. You can also see the word love on top of it. This is very hard to see due to the 3DS graphics. You can just barely make of it. In Chapter 7, when Poseidon was opening the sea for Pit, this is actually a reference to the crossing of the Red Sea in which God helped Moses by opening the Red Sea so the Israelites and Moses can pass through. In order to promote the release of Kid Icarus Uprising, there were these three animated shorts. The first animated short was called Phanatos Rising, produced by Projection IG Studio. It was a three-part animated short in which Pit must stop Phanatos from destroying the town nearby. After the Underworld Army, hijacks one of the humans' Trojan horses. The second animated short is Medusa's Revenge. This time it was produced by Studio 4 Celsius. It gives backstory on what happened before and during the first game that leads up to the events of Uprising. The third and final animated short, Palutena's Revolting Dinner, was produced by Shaft Incorporated. It was a two-parter animated short that focused on Palutena trying to make a special dinner for herself and Pit. But things don't go quite as planned. Out of all the animated shorts, this is probably the most lighthearted one. And probably my favorite one out of all three of them. But then again, all of them are actually great. I still enjoy these animated shorts, even to this day. I kind of wish we had like an animated series, because that would be fire. I mean, it could be possible, since Nintendo acquired Dynamo's Pictures and renamed it to Nintendo's Pictures, is it possible that we might get a Kid Icarus Uprising anime soon? I mean, I hope so, because hey, it, Nintendo, if you're listening, please do it. Please, please actually do it. Please, please, you know you want to. Please. And as well as Marisama's Castle. Pretty please. In Medusa's Revenge, in one of Medusa's flashbacks, Palutena and Medusa were using their uprising redesigns instead of their original designs found in the NES manual. Come to think of it, the designs found in the NES manual and Famicom manuals of Palutena, Pit, and Medusa don't really resemble them at all in the NES and Famicom versions in-game, especially for Palutena and Medusa. I kind of find this quite odd. You already have the designs in the manual, but yet you don't use it in-game. Captain N, the Game Master, was an animated series created by Dick Entertainment. It centers around Kevin Keane, also known as Captain N, being the titular character of the same name as he goes on to many adventures to different Nintendo games. The show ran from September 9th, 1989, all the way to October 26th, 1991. The show itself had three seasons. It features Pit as one of the main characters for the show, or what the show likes to call him, Kid Icarus, or Icarus for short. He comes from Mount Icarus instead of Sky World, and for some reason he can fly without using the wings of Pegasus. Not to mention, he says the suffix word Icus too many damn times. Yeah, that was basically his catchphrase. <laughs> The archery event, Princessicus. So I should be on the boxicus. Let me go, Icus. Icus this, Icus that. How about you shut the fuckest? 
the eggplant wizard, also makes an appearance. He's a reoccurring henchman that works for Mother Brain instead of Medusa. For some reason, he has the power to turn things into vegetables and fruits, unlike its game counterpart, in which he can only summon eggplants and turn things into one. Medusa does show up in the cartoon, looking like that. If you want to know if Palutena is in this cartoon, the answer is no. Well, there is this character, Princess Lana, that slightly resembles Palutena, but really isn't. She's basically the original character for the show and Captain Anne's love interest. Also in the show, the three sacred treasures are hidden in Mount Icarus for 10,000 years. Supposedly have magic powers that we never see in the show. It was just a beam of light within those three containers. The only way to destroy the three sacred treasures, according to the show, is to use the fire arrow, sacred bow, and the protective crystal, in which Medusa is guarding those items. And wait a minute! Two out of the three items are the three sacred treasures, and the other one is the sacred bow. The wings of Pegasus never showed up in the show and the comic book adaptation. Enemies from the series like Hugh Draw. Yes, did this actually Hugh Draw? And I wish I was joking. <laughs> oh no, it gets it gets even worse. It gets so much worse. There's Meek. There's Nettler that looks like a rejected Monster Incorporated character. Shemum, God of Poverty, Octox, Kipa, and Snowman. There was a comic book adaptation of Captain N. It featured Pit, Snowman, Hydra, Hippa, and the Eggplant Wizard. Alongside those characters, there was also more enemies from the Kid Icarus series that never appeared in the show, that only shows up in the comics. The following characters are Iranos, Uranus, Ernest, ah screw it, I'm calling him Ernest, Siren, Colin, Rockman, Hobo, ah oh, come on, how am I supposed to pronounce these names? I mean, look, I'm doing the best I can, alright? Troz, Monowai, Grin, Green, Giren? Ah, eh, go with Giren, he sounds more better. Cummy Loose, EOI, Huron, Thanatos, Ganymede, Plum, Gluten, Molia, and Zuri. Before I move on to the next topic, why did the show equality went downhill? This is Pit from Season 1, this is Pit from Season 2, and then there's Season 3, and oh my god, what the hell happened? Did they ran out of money or something? Did they not care anymore? I'm asking a question I probably don't know the answer to, or probably will never will, so let's move on. The inspiration for the Eggplant Wizard was from Torizawa's passion for eggplants, the Eggplant Man from Wrecking Crew, and his summer bonus. I can explain the first two, but his summer bonus? Gotta get that money though in order to eat. If you have no deaths in your game file and survive up to chapter 14, you'll get this special piece of dialogue. This is still alive and quite perky from the looks of things. But why does he get a second chance? It's not fair. Hmm. I can't believe Manicos is still alive and quite perky from the looks of things. Well, that's only fair. I haven't finished off a few times myself. In the NES manual, there's an unused game over screen. It's most likely a beta placeholder. Hades, Medusa, the Chariot Master, Lord Dentos, and Pyron were the only characters that don't have a weapon named after them. There is an item called Medusa's Head, but that doesn't really count since we're talking about weapons here. Thanatos was mistranslated to Thanatos in the NES version of Kid Icarus. The reason for this is because Thanatos' name in Japanese is Thanatosu. The localization team mistook it as his name. This was later fixed in the international release of Uprising. Not only the name change, there was also special dialogue for it. Protecting an impregnable mortal can be an awfully lonely. Is that you, Thanatos? Actually, I go by Thanatos now. The extra H is for us. Amazing! Have we met before? Uh -huh. I'm wounded! The inspired creation for Spec Nose came from Hiro Tanaka's large nose and novelty glasses that were inspired by Groucho Marx and his glasses. In the Japanese release of Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS, Patina's shorts and skirt were extended and darkened, so her legs would be less visible to see. This was later carried over to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate for all versions of the game. In the early concept art of Kid Icarus Uprising, it shows sirens without their chest plates, or bra of some sort, to resemble more to their original design from the first game. Amazon Pandora was given that treatment as well. In the concept art, Amazon Pandora was given less purple fabric around the chest, hip, and rear area. Despite the fact that Poseidon and Viridi showed up in story mode and have character portraits, their in-game models never showed up at all. The only time you can actually view their in-game models is in the idol section of the game. And come and think of it, I'm surprised we never got a Viridi boss fight, let alone a Poseidon boss fight. That would have been awesome. If we couldn't get a Poseidon boss fight, we need a Viridi boss fight. Because the amount of times Viridi insults Pit, you know that this goddess of lolly needs to be put in her place sometimes, you know? Don't you just want to slap her or hit her with a chancla or grab a cinturon and just smack her in the face? Because you know damn well she deserves it sometimes. Before anyone asks, yes, I know her 3D model does show up in this one cutscene, but it's more of a projection of her, not really the character herself. Plus, it doesn't show her entire body. Wait, I just realized something right now. Since Dark Pit and Pit are both angels, obviously, and it seems like the three sacred treasures can only be wear by angels. I mean, that's by speculation. I don't take that as an actual fact. Like I said before, I'm only just speculating here. What I'm trying to say is this. Can Dark Pit wear the three sacred treasures? 
I'm surprised that no one ever thought of this before. I mean, not to my common knowledge. It's one of those you don't really think about it up until now moments. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. One last thing before I move on to layer 3. Is there more Amazon people like Pandora? Are all the Amazonians part of the underworld? Or is she like the only one? If she actually is the only one, was it by choice? Or did she got banned by the other Amazonians? Because I always wonder about that ever since chapter 22. Perhaps they might explain it in the sequel. Oh, wait, I forgot. You guys did promise, right? 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 Before the introduction of AR cards, the category series had two official training cards that were found only in Nintendo Power Magazine. This was used to promote missing monsters. There were two variations of this card, the standard card and the collector's edition. The collector's edition had the words in shining gold color and the standard card didn't. On the back of both cards, it details the description of the card, a challenge for the player, the system it was on, the game type, the number of players, the release date, and the company that made the game. Howard and Esther, later renamed to Nestor's Adventures, was a comic strip found and started in Nintendo Power Magazine that ran from 1988 to 1993. In Nintendo Power Volume Number 31, one of Nestor's adventures and featured him in Kid Icarus Missing Monsters as he dreams of being Pit under Zeus's training. If you don't know by now, the Kid Icarus series and the Metroid series both share some similarities. For starters, Commandos look awfully similar to Metroids. Even Pit and Buridi had a conversation about this in Chapter 21. Commandos look an awful lot like little Metroids. No! Stop right there! What's the matter? All I said was that Kamados look like little Metro. <laughs> I can't hear you. Hey, what's your problem? This game universe and that game universe have nothing to do with each other. So don't go around spreading rumors. The original Kid Icarus used the same engine as the original Metroid. The same thing was done for Missing Monsters and Metroid 2, The Return of Samus. Dark Lord Gallo revealed to be a blonde woman in Chapter 2 might be a reference to Samus Aran. Last but not least, both series debuted in the same year in 1986. The NES and the Famicom version of Kid Icarus had some differences. The music in the Famicom version is slightly more enhanced, and it used different sound effects than the NES version. I'll let you hear it for yourself. I'll play the NES version first, then the Famicom disc version.
We all know this game as Kid Icarus, but in Japan, it was called Light Mythology, Palutena's Mirror. The NES version had a password system, while the Famicom Disk version had a three-slot save system and a kill mode. I tried to look up online to see what it, what this is supposed to do, but I found nothing about it. So I played the Japanese version of Kid Icarus on the NES online, and the only thing that it did was that it deleted my save file. I thought there was going to be a more difficult mode for this game, but yeah, the only thing that it did was that it deleted my save file. I mean, the game was already hard as it is, so um, the pause screen in the Famicom Disk version has blue bricks upon obtaining the map the map's text color is in green the player's save file is at the top of the screen and the text color is in white in the nes version the pause screen has gray bricks the map's text is visible at all times regardless if you have the map or not and the text colors are in white blue and beige in the famicom disc version in the palace in the sky level the player had to press the a button to make pit fly and the screen moves along with him also you can stand touch or in this case hover on the different colored bricks and getting to medusa is a lot more quicker but in the nes version you you don't have to press the A button to make Pit fly, and the screen auto scrolls by itself. The different colored bricks become part of the background, and the stage itself is somehow a little bit more longer. For some reason. Not sure why. In the NES version, there are five different endings with exclusive backgrounds. A message was added to a different screen. It features credits after one of the endings, and the best ending is exclusive to this version. The ending you get in this version is dependent on the number of hearts, endurance, strength, and weapons. Each category I'm going to mention must be maxed out to count, otherwise it doesn't count. Let's put this in a point system, just to make it clear. Maxing out one category counts as one point. The number of hearts you must max out is 999. Endurance is 5 pieces or segments. For strength, you have to max out all 5 arrows. And for the weapons, there's a total of 3. Here are the requirements for each ending. To get the worst ending, you must get 0 points, and Pit will get a sickle, and he becomes Farmer Pit. To get the bad ending, you must get 1 point, and Pit will get a helmet. He becomes an average trooper in Palatine. His army. To get the normal ending, you must get two points and Pit will receive a plume helmet. This will make him the captain of Palatina's army. To get the good ending, you must get three points and Palatina will turn Pit into a taller, more muscular Pit. To get the best ending, you must get all four points and Palatina will turn Pit into a taller and more muscular Pit and she will kiss him on the cheek. The Famicom Disc version's endings are dependent on the player's strength, endurance, and the number of continues. Just like before, we're going to use the point system again. Each health segment or pieces count as 10 points and every continue is negative at one point. Here are the requirements for each ending. Less than 60 points, you get turned to a spec nose. 60 to 79 points, you become farmer pit. 80 to 84 points, you turn into trooper pit. 85 to 99 points, you turn into captain pit. For the perfect 100 points, you turn into a tall muscular chad pit, but there's no kiss on the cheek. Every single ending has a black background. The best ending in the NES version is not in this version. Like I already shown before, there's a exclusive worst ending where a pit gets turned into a spec nose. The message that was on a separate screen in the NES version is shown in the same screen with Pit and Palatina. If you want to know what it says in English, it says the light of peace has returned to Angel Land. However, your fight doesn't end here. You must keep battling to protect this peace. After you get one of the endings, there's no credits. It just boosts you back to the title screen. A humanoid Medusa shows up in the NES version, and after you defeat her, a exploding cutscene will play, followed by jingle music. This was not in the Famicom Disk version. If you completed the game, you get to keep everything that you have in your first playthrough. I mean, that's if you've been playing the game non-stop. This cannot be done in the Famicom Disk version. If you want to play the game again on the same save file, you don't get to keep anything. Kinda sucks, really. But then again, the NES didn't have a save system, so... I guess that's one advantage in all of this. Good on you, NES version. You can haggle the shopkeeper to lower the price or accidentally raise the price. This is determined by pit strength and the stage number. For example, if you're on stage 2, and your strength is on 1, it's most likely you're going to fail haggling the shopkeeper. But if you're on stage 2, and your strength is on, let's say, 3, it's most likely guaranteed that the shopkeeper will lower the price. In the NES version, you have to press or hold the A button and the B buttons on the second controller at the same time. You have to use the second controller that has a built-in mic and say something like, lower the price please in Japanese. Since I don't really have a Famicom system, I ordered in the Japanese exclusive Famicom controllers for the Nintendo Switch. These special controllers could be used to play both the NES and the Famicom games on the Nintendo Switch Online. The second controller that has a built-in mic only works for Famicom games. If you want to use it for the NES games, sorry about that, it won't work. Trust me, I tried. All I have to do is just boot up the Famicom Disk version of Kid Icarus and get to the shopkeeper and... Voila! Alright, I'm here. You know, I could say load the price please in Japanese, but... I have a different approach. All I have to do is press the second controller, hold the A button, and threaten the shopkeeper's life. Listen here.
if you do not lower these prices, so help me God, so help me God, I'm about to give you this five knuckle shuffle and an almighty three two beating. Do you understand? Or you can just blow into the mic really loud while holding the A button. Nah, my way is way more better. You can't really haggle the shopkeeper, but you can haggle the black marketeer in Myths and Monsters. All you have to do is press left, down, A, B. On the 3DS Classic, press the A button and the select or start button. Also on the other note, if you want to know if the 3DS mic works on the 3DS Classic, the answer is no. Yeah, kind of a missed opportunity there. Not sure why they didn't add that in. I mean, the mic is on the built-in system, but why not use it? Oh, Nintendo, you had one job. One freaking job. On August 4th, 2011, a Kitagura's float was in Goshiwara Taishina Puda Festival in Namimori Prefecture of Japan. They handed out a special Kitagura's float AR card during this event. Before the parade, if you live in Japan, you can send your Mii to Nintendo so it can be viewed in the parade. You need to save your Mii to an SD card in Mii Maker and then send a photo to Nintendo on the official Japanese Nintendo website. The Mies will appear on a 10 meter long pedestal on the float from the left, right, and the back part of the pedestal, except for the front. Also on the website, you can see all the Mies that appear on the float under the Check Your Me category, and you can download an official picture of the parade float to your PC or Mac. For this video I'm about to show you, I kind of need your help on this one. I think this is considered lost media of some sort. There was a 3DS video on the now defunct Nintendo Video Service that showcased the Kitagura's float, the music, and the other floats in the parade. This is the only video I can find at the moment. It's the one where Sakura I was going behind the scenes on how the parade flow was being made. I watched the entire thing and I thought it was pretty cool. Unless this is the video in which I'm talking about. Or maybe it's something else. You know, the more I think about it, I don't seem to find as well as... Well, how do I put this? Before I move on to the next topic, I have one question for you guys. Was anybody that was there on August 4th, 2011, does anybody have footage of the Kitagura's float in action as well as the other parade floats? When I was researching for this topic, I can't find any footage or pictures from that day. And what I mean by that, was anybody there in the crowd taking footage or pictures of it? If anybody was actually there during the day of the festival, please upload footage of it or pictures. I mean, that works too because I kind of want to see the prey flow in action from a different point of view, you know? On March 12, 2012, Nintendo teamed up with Takata Tomy to release an official Kitagura's Uprising Choco Snacks. It costs about 100 yen or about one US dollar per bag. In the bag, it comes with chocolate balls that strangely look like bootlegged Cocoa Puffs. Besides these bootlegged Cocoa Puffs, it comes with one AR card out of the 20 that's provided with the snacks. The Fortress Guardians and Missing Monsters were given the three sacred treasures despite the fact that the Fortress Guardians were the bosses in Missing Monsters. They're not really evil at all. In fact, Halatena was the one that gave them the three sacred treasures. I mean, I can see why. Since the three sacred treasures were stolen in the first game, I can see why she wants more security of the three sacred treasures. You know, that begs the question, where in the hell were these forces guardians in Uprising? Did Palatina didn't need them anymore since Pit beat them? Where the hell did they went? I hope they come back someday. A three disc soundtrack was released in Japan only on August 21st, 2012 by Slay Bells and Procyon Studio. The first edition versions were marked by a ghost sticker on the case and an included Daybreaker and Pit Revive AR cards. The music selection was an exclusive CD disc to Club Nintendo members in Japan on March 22nd, 2012. It contains some of the soundtracks from the three disc music. Looking at all the soundtracks listed, it seems that the vault menu theme is not on any of the disc soundtracks. According to Nintendo's UK website, Sakurai provided commentary to some soundtracks. Here's what he had to say to some of the soundtracks. The main menu theme of Kid Icarus is Palutena's theme song. Their battle theme in Chapter 2 and Dark Lord Gallo's castle theme is actually a different arrangement of Magma's theme. It even used the same motif. According to this tidbit right here, it states that Magma Steam used a melody from the Famicom Disc version of Kid Icarus. After listening to the soundtrack for the original Kid Icarus, if I had to guess, it might be the Overworld theme. This could make sense since, you know, Magma is human and the humans live in the Overworld. Put two and two together and boom, you make the connection. Dark Pit Steam is the most rearranged soundtrack in Uprising. There's the original, the Ruins of the Temple, Dark Pit Steam, the one in Chapter 9, and the Staff Roar Edition. And the Hades Infernal theme, if you listen closely, there's a Chorus to chance Hades halfway through the song. The theme for the Rapid the Reset Bomb was originally going to play when you must stop the Reset Bomb in Chapter 12. Sakurai liked the song so much, it basically became the main theme song for the forces of nature. The first half of the Iron Brain Fortress and the main theme of Missing Monsters sound similar to each other. In Mips and Monsters game files, there's an unused golden lion found with the other boss's graphics. It's most likely a placeholder for the actual bosses. The next topic I'm about to go over is the Kid Icarus Uprising beta. And trust me, there's a lot. I had to redo this 
about three to four times. At E3 of 2010, Satoru Iwata revealed that Kitagura's Uprising was going to be developed by Project Sora. In the beginning of the trailer, it had a different logo in all white text, including Palutena's army logo. Pitt and Palutena had different voice actors. Pitt was voiced by Troy Lund instead of Anthony Del Rio. Palutena's voice actress in this trailer is still unknown even to this day, but it does sound like Ali Hill is Palutena's voice. The Power of Flight was originally called the Miracles of Flight, since they're going by the literal translation of the name. The enemy monoized tentacles were slightly longer. Enemies were spawning in different locations in Chapter 1. Pit was flying in an unknown location in the trailer. And towards the end of the trailer, the logo was now in all black tax, as well as the Palutena Army logo. Tax Slacks was designed way different in the beta version. Mega Muscle had 9 pearls instead of 3. Powers were called by their Japanese name, Miracles. The promotional artwork for the Power of Flight and Monolith were different. At a Nintendo 3DS press event in New York, they were showing off the Kidigar's Uprising demo. And here's some of the stuff I found in this demo. The top screen showed a beta logo, while the bottom screen showed Touch. The only chapters that were available were chapters 1 and 4. The title for chapter 1 was going by the literal translation of the Japanese title name for chapter 1, that being the second coming of Palutena, instead of the return of Palutena. The only weapons that were available were the Blade, Claws, and Obertards. The main menu theme is different from the final version. It includes vocals, which I kind of wish they kept in. <laughs> There were unused sound effects when selecting the chapters, weapon of choice, and tapping the two arms option. After choosing your weapon of choice, the top screen will display a 3DS on how to play, the bottom screen will display a two arms option with a silhouette of Pit on it that was later used in the final version. Pit was still voiced by Troy Lund, and Palutena was still voiced by an unknown voice actress. The dialogue in this demo was way different, and which I'm gonna show later on. Palutena doesn't have that echo voice effect in the demo. There's a time limit of six minutes in the top center of the top screen. It doesn't have the battery life icon in the upper right corner of the top screen. You can't use special attacks, and the icons are not there. There are no energy orbs in the air battle section. Enemies don't drop hearts after being defeated. They sometimes drop food instead. Intensity gates are not in this demo. Treasure boxes had the drinks of the gods instead of weapons and powers. The character portraits, well, not really character portraits, but more like a close-up of the character's face expression and a very small square box. And the dialogue is at the bottom of the top screen. The bottom screen had a circle pad icon, a black purplish background with a blue purplish border around it, and four lines crossing each other. There's less enemies in both chapters, especially in chapter one. Pit's model freezes in place as the screen fades to black before facing the boss of the chapter. And and there's no loading screen. The I'm finished screen is not there. After you lose all your health, you just respawn back where you left off. I will now go over the changes found in each chapter. In chapter 1, Medusa says she's been gone for 24 years in this demo, instead of 25 years, like in the final version. Palutena breaks the fourth wall and mentions that this is a demo. A Shema base is placed near the fountain on the left side instead of the right side. Twin Bellows model looks unfinished. After beating chapter 1, the bottom screen will show the logo, the name of the chapter, and the difficulty it was on. The top screen will display the score points, how much time is remaining, a portrait of Palutena with the words coming soon. The Great Reaper used a Japanese Screech Scream like in the Famicom Disc version of Kid Icarus instead of the NES Reaper Screech Scream like in the final version. There are less food items once starting the land battle. Consuming the food sound effect is different and the recovering sound effect after regaining back some of your health is not implemented yet. There are no energy orbs in this demo. The soundtrack that plays during the boss fights is using boss fight number two music instead of boss fight number one music. Palutena calls the Great Reaper BR. If you don't know what that stands for, it stands for Big Reaper. She only says this only in this demo. The Zodiac Chamber containing the Taurus arms is not in this demo. And once completing the chapter, the results screen will show. But instead of a portrait of Palutena, it's a portrait of Medusa instead. At Gamescom 2011, there was a brand new Kid Icarus Uprising demo. Just like last time, I'll go over the changes that were found in this demo. The battery life icon is still not there. In the top center of the top screen, it still has a time limit, but this time it's five minutes instead of six. Before playing the demo, the bottom screen will say touch, increase your play by defeating enemies. The top screen will display Kid Icarus Uprising demo version, 5 minutes. It features chapters 1, 2, and 3, with a banner of Palutena, Magmus, and Hudra. The difficulty for chapter 1 was set on easy, chapter 2 was set on normal, and chapter 3 was set on hard. Chapter 1 now has the North America version title, being the return of Palutena, instead of the second coming of Palutena. There's a banner for each weapon, except for the staffs and clubs. After choosing your weapon of choice, the top screen will display a 3DS, and on how to play the game, 
game and the bottom screen will display you can now adjust the feeling of the depth using the 3d depth slider below the text is the same blue and gold trim two arms option from the nyc preview event demo it features different dialogue from the previous demo but still different from the final version the character portraits and dialogue are now in the bottom screen just like in the final version Pit is now voiced by anthony del rio and palatina is now voiced by ali hillis palatina's voice doesn't have that echo voice effect pit's model still freezes in place as the screen fades to black but it's more noticeable this time for some reason the loading screen takes a little bit more longer a different sound effect is used when defeating a boss of the chapter <laughs> The result screen is different. The bottom screen during the loading screen is different. You still can't use special attacks, and the icons are still not there. There are still no energy orbs. I could be hearing this wrong. Pit makes this weird sound once he takes damage. <laughs> The sound effect for recovering your health is different. It's slightly more higher pitch, unlike in the final version. You still respond back where you left off after you lose all your health. Every treasure box still had the drinks of the gods, and the intensity gauge are still not there. In chapter 1 in this demo, Medusa still says 24 years instead of 25 years. The air battle music is different, there are still no recovery orbs, the crowd noise is a little bit more noisier, and it lasts longer. Do you hear that? Do you hear the people's cheers? They're celebrating the return of the goddess Palutena. Despite the underworld invasion, the people haven't lost hope. It's our duty to protect, it's our duty to protect them. Prepare for land battle, Pit. There's a drink of the gods in the start of the land battle instead of food. A shema vase is placed in front of a treasure box in this demo for some reason. Kind of a weird choice to place it there. There are two Ganyu meets in front of this wrecking ball instead of one. Twin Bellows model is still unfinished, but it looks a lot more better this time. The soundtrack being played during the boss fight is still boss fight theme number two. Take out his way. If you're in a tight spot, flip the serpent pad to dash. I also recommend dashing and shooting at the same time. Change dash directions and charge your shot for different effect. Whatever it's called, just stay out of this way. If you're in a tight spot, And Pitt's model still freezes in place as the screen fades to black. But once again, it's still noticeable. Twin Bellow! In chapter 2 in this demo, a Shemim is placed in front of this location instead of a scuttler. A shaman face is placed sideways for some reason. Not sure why. The Zodiac Chamber contained a Sagittarius bow. It's not in this demo. Instead of Magma's theme being played, after meeting him for the very first time, it doesn't really play his theme song. Instead, it played a beta version of the Thundercloud Temple. I think you should help him. He's taking on the Underworld Army himself. And surviving. Are you sure this guy is really a human? Absolutely. Are you having a private conversation with yourself, Angel Face? Oh, right. Sorry about that. I'm Pit, servant of Palutena. I'm here to defeat Dark Lord Gal. So, you're here for a slice of the pie, too? Huh? Pie? Where? This could mean three things. One, they forgot to include this in. Two, Magma's theme was not composed yet. Or three, perhaps maybe at one point, this was originally supposed to be Magma's theme song. Now moving on to chapter three. There are no enemies behind Hugh Stackshot shoots a weak purple laser, and it uses a different sound effect. Commanders were not found on these stairs. There's a Nettler and three monoliths placed here. I'm not sure why, but out of all the demo footage I've seen, this is the only demo and the only time I see the game lag. The game lags during chapter three, right around here. I am so glad this was fixed in the final version. Here are a bunch of Kid Icarus Uprising beta screenshots that I categorize in two categories. The first category is the cool behind the scenes production screenshots, like these. 
And the other screenshots are, well, they're shit posts. I mean, I'm not sure how to describe it, but yeah, they're absolute shit posts. And not to mention, oh my god, what the hell is this? So thank you, Sakurai, for this monstrosity. This is definitely going to haunt me in my dreams for the rest of my life, isn't it? May the gods have mercy on us all. There's a bunch of dialogues that went on you, so have a listen. Sorry if I miss any. I can hardly believe my eyes. Set it to your liking. Whoa! Now this looks familiar. But it's not exactly the same. Whatever. We have to move forward. We have to defeat Medusa. Now face the alleyway. <laughs> I'm readying my Palutena Glam Blaster for deployment. Once preparations are complete, I will launch an attack. You don't have to do that. Let me handle it. And here's that backup I mentioned. What are those Centurions doing? Why are Palutena's troops attacking the town? What is going on here? I've got to get to the bottom of this. Oh man, this can't be happening. How am I attacking humans? Everything's gone off the rails. Now what am I supposed to do? Take myself down? I guess I don't have a choice. There was a war between the underworld and the forces of nature. Early in the war, Palutena's army vanished. Years. That was three years That's... ago. Over a thousand days! Yeah, thanks for the math lesson. Anyway, when Palutena's forces reappeared, they began launching attacks across the land. As you can imagine, this was a shock to the humans. No one knows what happened. Did your goddess just lose her mind? Don't ask me. I've been a ring. But I know I have to do something. There must be some way we can reason with her. It's possible that someone else has taken over her entire army. Okay, first things first, that guy attacking the town? That wasn't me. So, your mind is here, but your body is over there destroying stuff. Isn't that convenient? Tell that to Look, all the I didn't people exactly your body plan it just Whether you did or not, there's nothing I can do for you You've now. got my body, so you're going to have to get rid of the other pit. Ironically, that's why I was here in the first place. Well, if that's our only option... I guess that's the plan. Careful with my body, though. I'm going to need it later. Guess she must have heard you. Well, this is a nice design, no, Flourish. it's a practice track for the lightning chariot. It's not for amateurs. As you know, Reapers are responsible for carrying souls. But we've got, but we've an, got excess an excess of souls, of souls these, these days. days. The, Reapers the Reapers can't, can't handle, them handle them all. So the extra souls come here? Yes, though some just fade away, and others are, well, eaten. Even in the afterlife, it's survival, survival of the fittest. That makes some sense. The weak are consumed, just as nature intended. Pardon me, if you will. I must go entertain my guests. Hello? If Veridi's army is attacking, they're doing it awfully quietly. At least I'm doing something, Pit. I You're really such need a to stop slacker. talking to myself. Oh. Thanks, Veridi. Don't thank me yet. Get your heads back in the game. Let's finish this once and for all! There are two soundtracks that went unused in Uprising. The first unused soundtrack was the air battle music in Chapter 16. Even though this soundtrack went unused, it can still be listened in the official soundtrack. If you want to know where to listen to this, it was in the three disc soundtrack. It was in disc number two, track number 16. The second unused soundtrack was the air battle music in Chapter 11. Well, it's not really a track. I don't really consider this a soundtrack. I mean, that's if you call it a soundtrack. It's just 90 seconds of silence. Either this was like a mistake, placeholder for another soundtrack that went unused, or never recorded, but if we got to take this out, but who knows. Footage from E3 2011 showcased the AR car battle in action. The theme being played during the AR car battle fight is Dark Pit's theme, but it sounds different. <laughs> Before the AR car battle fight, the Solomon theme is being played, but it sounds different too. There were some differences in the Japanese release and the international release of Kitagura's Uprising. The Japanese boxer for Uprising had Pit smiling, and the international release of the game had Pit with an angry expression. In the North America version, Dark Pit in Chapter 22 mentions Brain Age, but in the PAL version, he says Brain Training instead. Your math is a little off. You might want to break out the brain age, pal. I have a brain age. You might want to break out the brain training, pal.
って。In the final battle with Hades, Hades was the one that sneezes. But in the Japanese version, Pit was the one that sneezes. And it includes a Pit sneezing portrait. I'm not sure why this was changed. Like, it didn't really affect the story at all. I mean, it affected the dialogue, but that's about it. I don't think we never got a clear answer on that. I mean, if so, let me know. Because I'm actually curious on this. In Japan, Dark Pit was called Black Pit. And his nickname was Blappy. A fun little fact about this. Dark Pit's nickname could be a reference to an American actor, Brad Pitt. Since in Japan, he's called Brappy. Depending on your language region, Dark Pit's name was different, along with his nickname. In the English language, we all know Dark Pit as Pitu. Germany calls him Finster Pit, which translates to Darker Pit or Dark Pit. Okay, the nickname they gave him was Pitu, but it was spelled different. It was the word Pit and the number two. The French call him Pit Malefique, which translates to Maleficent Pit. In Spanish, it was called Pit Sombrio, which translates to Gloomy Pit. Wait, that can't be right. This will imply that Dark Pit is depressed all the time. That could explain the edginess from him. Poor Dark Pit, he really needs a hug. His nickname in Spanish is Pitu. It's spelled the word Pit with the Roman numeral two. In the Italian language, Dark Pit is called Pit Oscuro, which translates to Dark Pit. You wanna know what nickname they gave him in the French and Italian version. It is so dumb. It really is way more stupider than Pitu. The nickname they gave him in the French and Italian version is Tip. That's right. Tip. Look, I get what they're trying to do, but still. If you ask me, Pitu sounds more menacing. If we're gonna nickname him Tip, why not just call him Tip Top? The nickname is already stupid as it is, so why not just call him Tip Top? You could have gone with Pitu, but no. You have to go with Tip. For shame, French and Italians. Or shame. In chapter 9, when Dark Pit dive kicks the underworld gatekeeper, he's completely fine and brags about it. But in a Japanese version, he gets hurt while doing this. And that's how you take out a boss. For future reference, face kicking isn't usually this effective. Get a move on before more defenses show up. Pitu's right. We should go, even if it means taking orders from him. Thanks, Pitu. Please stop calling me that. Pit, get ready to go in. On June 19, 2019, a YouTuber by the name of Knox Robbins uploaded a video of a Pitch Captain N reboot trailer. According to the description of the video, it would have featured a brand new protagonist and a brand new storyline. Something completely different from the original Captain N. If you want to know what happened to this project, in that same description, it states that he tried to pitch it to a local studio, but it got turned down. Kind of a shame, really. The trailer looks pretty good. I can tell the amount of time and effort was put into this. I hope one day Captain N might come back. And come and think of it, does Nintendo still own Captain N? Or yet, scratch that. Is Nintendo still aware of Captain N? When was the last time he was ever used? Does Nintendo still want to acknowledge Captain N? I mean, do they still care about him? I guess we'll never know. Maybe one day Captain N might come back. Some AR cards had some differences before their final release, and some were never released outside of Japan for a while, or never released at all. At E3, San Diego Comic Con, and a GameStop conference in Las Vegas, Nevada in 2011, you were able to get prototypes of the AR cards in a 3-pack. Following three AR cards were Pit, Palatina, and Medusa. The prototype AR cards used the Kid Icarus Uprising beta logo, it lacked the color bit in the bottom left corner. If you don't know what that is, you basically need it in order to scan the card. Some cards use name placeholders and different character artwork. There were other prototype cards during these conventions, but we don't know if they were given out to anybody. The following AR cards were Magmus, Hewdraw, Dark Lord Gallo, Fighter, Mono Eye, Stack Eye, Fireworm, Siren, Meek, Scuttler, Standard Overtards, First Blade, Violet Palm, Crusher Arm, Easy Cannon, Tiger Claws, and the Fortune Bow. The North America, PAL, and Japanese versions of the AR cards have the same artwork in the final version, but each region had a different appearance, had different names and codes. The North America and the Japanese version AR cards look similar to each other, but it's the PAL version that's way different, and probably my favorite one. The PAL version for the AR cards features different colored borders around it, it listed different multiple translations of the names, it lacked the affiliation, listed above the card name, and the rarity of the card. If you look on the top right corner, you will see the rarity of the card. If it has a silver wing, it's an uncommon. If it has a golden wing, it's 
it's considered rare. Okay, last but not least, if it has a diamond wing, it's considered ultra rare. Another way to know what region your car is from, just look in the bottom left corner of the card. This was the AR card code I mentioned earlier. Every single code starts in AKD, followed by another letter, and the car number the AR card represents. If your code starts in AKDE, that's the North America version. AKDP is the PAL version, and AKDJ is the Japanese version. There are many different ways to obtain AR cards. To get these booster packs in Japan and Europe, you have to go to retail stores. In Europe, you can get these booster packs by spending star points in Club Nintendo, and Nintendo will ship the booster packs to your location. In issue number 1217 of Fumato Magazine, it came with Feridi, Frankelange, Arlon, and Bosphora AR cards. Once again, in Europe, you can get AR cards from the official Nintendo magazine, and one of them was the Three Sacred Treasures. If you pre-order the game in Germany and Greece, you'll get the starter booster pack that comes with the game, and a special booster pack that comes with 24 AR cards, which includes such as the Three Sacred Treasures and the Power of Flight. To get the Three Sacred Treasures in Japan, you have to get the Japanese player guide. To get this AR card in Europe, you have to buy the official Nintendo magazine and mail it to Nintendo to receive it. The first print edition of the three disc soundtrack had Daybreaker and Pit Revive AR cards. This was exclusive in Japan only. Pit Wingless was only obtained in the first edition Japanese player strategy guide. To get the Mono Eye and Pit Injured AR cards, you have to buy the first edition of the Pit Figma figure that came with it. The first edition Dark Pit Figma figure came with Dark Pit Flying and Magnus and Dark Lord Gallo AR cards. Kitagris Float AR card was only available from July 31st all the way to August 31st of 2012 at Panasonic Center in Tokyo in Tachi Neptune Museum in Gochigawara City, Arimori Prefecture of Japan. In North America, it was a hassle to get these AR cards. Consider yourself lucky if you live in Japan and Europe because you guys got lucky. In North America, you have to go to local Nintendo events during the weekends at Pacific EB Games, GameStop, and Best Buy locations. It was one booster pack per person. Another way is to go to PAX East 2012 from April 6th to the 8th in Boston, Massachusetts. WonderCon 2012 from March 16th to the 18th in Anaheim, California. If you were a Club Nintendo member in North America, they were giving away Great Reaper, Palatina, and Drill Arms AR cards for free. On April 14th, 2012, you can visit GameStop locations and participate in gameplay sessions to received by AR cards. These include the Eggplant Wizard, Skyscraper Club, Fireworks Cannon, Minos, and the Fiend Cauldron. On launch date in North America, which was March 23rd, 2012, if you are in Nintendo World in New York and be the first 25 customers, you will receive the three sacred treasures. Yeah, the first 250 customers. Imagine if you were customer number 251, because damn, that's gotta suck. This AR card is considered super rare, especially here in North America. By pre-ordering the game in Canada, you will receive five AR cards at random. In Nintendo Power issue number 277, it included Poseidon, Banatos, and Medusa Battle. Issue number 228 of Game Informer magazine had the Power of Flight. The Best Buy Gamer magazine had Pit Rally Cry, Pandoria, and the Samurai Blade AR cards. Prima Strategy Guide came with Hades, Exotank, and Dark Pit Flying. To get all of the AR cards, you have to go to an official Kid Icarus Uprising multiplayer tournament held by Nintendo in 2012. These tournaments were held at certain GameStop locations across the US, and when I mean across the US, I I mean only in San Francisco, California on March 8th, Orlando, Florida on March 11th, Los Angeles, California on March 15th, and one in New York on March 22nd. The winners from each location are eligible to win prizes, such as the 400 AR cards, not to mention an all-expense paid trip to New York to participate in the final tournament. There was another way to win all 400 AR cards. You have to enter an official Kid Icarus Uprising AR card set giveaway. Only 10 were given out at random. Some of the AR cards came with the physical copies of the game. The first three AR cards you'll get is is Palatina, Pit, and Medusa, Queen of the Underworld. The other three AR cards are selected at random. This is what you might get. Twin Bellows, Magmus, Dark Lord Gallo, Three-Headed Hudra, Dark Pit, First Blade, Insight Staff, Tiger Claws, Fortune Bow, Violet Palm, Or Club, Easy Cannon, Standard Obertards, Pressure Arm, Mono Eye, Meek, or Stack Jaw. Pit Victory was digitally released worldwide on Twitter on December 4th, 2018 to celebrate the upcoming release of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Pit Wingless, Magmus and Dark Lord Gallo, Pit Injured, and the Kid Icarus Floats AR cards were never released outside of Japan. Besides Pit Victory, the other AR card that was never released as well was Medusa Rare. A mock-up of the card was made by Crow...
and an unknown on the Kid Icarus fan reddit. And yes, scanning it will work. During the launch of Kid Icarus Uprising in Nintendo World in NYC, they display a bunch of Kid Icarus memorabilia. At the memorabilia, they display this big ass AR cards of Pit, Palatina, and Medusa. But they were using the prototype version. Not a lot of people talk about this. It makes me wonder if Nintendo still has these. Better yet, do they have more big ass AR cards? Well, I get the feeling this might be taken out of context. I, I don't know, but any okay, anyway, but yeah, these cards are huge. If anybody was wondering, you can actually scan these AR cards. Trust me, I tried it out. It does work. Take a look at these Centurion's Petrified Sprites. They depict them holding a shield and a spear. But once you free them by using a mallet, they're carrying bows instead. It's a small little detail that I did not plan to put on this iceberg until I replayed the game. Wait a minute. If Pit is the only angel left in the original Kid Icarus, then what the hell are these then? Are these baby angels? Or are they Putos? Did they die after the game? Did they just die off or something? Well, I guess it's one of those answers I will never find out. Well, that's the end of the third layer. Now moving on to the fourth layer. The next time you're hungry, we're not going to McDonald's. We're not going to Burger King. Nor are we going to Whataburger. Speaking of which, have you guys ever tried your sweet and spicy bacon burger? It tastes good like chef's kiss. Absolutely chef's kiss. It is good. But anyway, going back on topic, there was an official Kid Icarus Uprising food truck. This was at a local GameStop at New York during the launch of the game and a multiplayer tournament where people can sign up and win prizes. The food truck provided Greek inspired food, according to this video. Okay, looking at this video, I can conclude that there was no floor ice cream. What the fuck? Damn, you had one job, Nintendo. One freaking job. Look, in all seriousness, was there anybody there during the launch? Was anybody there during that time? If so, what kind of food was there? They said it was Greek-inspired food, but like what? Like falafels or something? Okay, leave a comment below if you were there. The development of the original Kid Icarus was developed by one guy, that being the series creator, Doru Uzawa. While Nintendo's R&D 1 team was finishing developing Metroid, the entire development team went on vacation. Doru stayed in the office alone during the month of August. He only got help from Nintendo's R&D 1 team after the whole development team got back from their vacation. Yoshio Sakamoto thought the development of the game wasn't going to be finished before the December 19, 1986 deadline. The next three to four months were absolutely development hell. The concept on nighters, sleeping on cardboard boxes, on the office floors. When the month of December came along, Nintendo decided to turn off their AC to save energy. They had to use curtains and more cardboard boxes to keep warm. Out of anyone during development of the game, Doru Uzawa had it even worse. He got married during the development of the game and took three days off for his honeymoon. This was short-lived because on his second day off, Yoshishio Sakamoto called him to come back to the office. The game was so-called finished. The reason why I say this is because Doru Uzawa didn't have time to check for bugs, glitches, playtest the game, and didn't have time to add credits to the game. Three days before the December 19 deadline, which could explain why it wasn't in the Famicom Disk version, but yet it was in the NES version. The Kid Icarus series was going to be more serious, or in this case, more mature, ever since the first game, according to the series creator, Doru Uzawa. But Nintendo's R&D 1 wanted to add more comedic stuff to it. This could explain the Eggplant Wizard, Spec Nose, and credit cards, just to name a few. You know, I never thought of this until now, the Kid Icarus series takes place in Greek mythology during modern times. In some ways. Well, sort of, if you really think about it. I mean, do I have to explain this? The credit cards in the first two games, the high-tech devices, the mentioning of recycling, some of the enemies, aliens, and so much more. I really don't mind this. It gives the series its charm, you know? That's what makes it so special. There were a few official mangas throughout the years. The first being Go Go Pitkun was found in a Japanese guidebook for the first game. Volume 21 of One Paku Technique series had a 192 page strategy guide turned into a full manga called Kid Icarus, the manga. There is a YouTuber named GTV Japan that translated a whole 992 page manga into a 20 minute video. If you guys have time, go check it out. It's really good. They did an excellent job translating it. Mist of Light, Palatine's Mirror, Overthrow Devil in the Shrine was a Futawa Basha Famicom Future on Adventure game book published by Futawa Basha Publishers Limited. The last current manga of the series was in 2012 being Kid Icarus Uprising, Heads of Huge Draw, that was found in Japanese guidebooks for Uprising. Besides the 3 disc soundtrack, the music selection CD, Figma figures, amiibos, AR cards, mangas, adventure game book, Coco snacks, training cards, and guidebooks, there were other Kid Icarus merchandise. Kid Icarus and Metroid Original Soundtrack Orchestra version is a two-sided orchestrated version of the soundtrack of Kid Icarus and Metroid that was composed by the composer of Kid Icarus, Hirokazu Tanaka. It was released on February 25th, 1987, on both cassette and vinyl, published by Funhouse. Side A 
had Kid Icarus, and Side B had Metroid. There is a total of six soundtracks in both cassette and vinyl. The first soundtrack is the main title theme of Kid Icarus. The second track is a melody of the Underworld, Overworld, Sky World, and the Palace in the Sky, combined into one. The third soundtrack is the ending theme. The Metroid soundtrack consists of title theme, a melody of the startup sound, Grand Star, and the escape theme. There were other soundtracks collaborations. Game Sound Museum, Famicom Edition, number 13, DD soundtrack of Kid Icarus, Famicom 20th Anniversary, Original Soundtracks, Volume 1, Nintendo Famicom Music, Blue Spec CD2, Disc System Selection, E to CD, Side A, Nintendo's Famicom Music, Volume 2, Famicom's 20th Anniversary Arranged Soundtracks, and Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS Soundtracks. A port of Kid Icarus was part of the Famicom miniseries for the Game Boy Advance that was exclusive in Japan. The game was also part of the NES Classic Edition, but strangely, not in the Famicom Classic Edition. Some of the characters were part of the Famicom Choco series. If you don't know what these things are, they're just a bunch of small rubber erasers that comes in different colors, and some of them glow in the dark. A Kid Icarus flyer that was used to the first game during that time in Japan, a pit pin badge that was given out during E3 of 2011 at Nintendo's booth area, the Kid Icarus Uprising multiplayer trophy that was given to the winner at the official Kid Icarus Uprising multiplayer tournament during the launch of the game. There was also official t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, and a bunch of promotional posters and decorations. If you pre-order Kid Icarus Uprising in North America, you can receive a download code of the 3DS Classic of Kid Icarus. Like I said before, some copies of Uprising came with a 3DS stand. If you were a Club Nintendo member and reached Platinum status, you can receive a limited edition double-sided poster of Pit and Dark Pit. Another poster you can get from Club Nintendo for 700 gold coins is a Super Smash Bros. 3-set posters, one of which has Pit, Palutena, and Link from Palutena's reveal trailer. Also, Pit was also in Shulk's poster and Duck Hunt Dog's poster. Yes, I'm counting those posters as well as part of the iceberg. I mean, Pit is right there, so why not? For Club Nintendo members, you can get Kid Icarus Uprising for 700 gold coins, the 3D classic Kid Icarus for 200 gold coins, Kid Icarus of Mr. Monsters for 150 gold coins, and the Wii U port of Kid Icarus for 200 gold coins as well. For my Nintendo members in Japan and America, during the 5th anniversary of Uprising, you can spend 80 gold points to receive 30% off of Uprising, 20 gold points to get 30% off on the Kid Icarus 3DS Classic, the NES Kid Icarus on the Wii U, and Kid Icarus Myths and Monsters on the 3DS. This offer was only for a limited time up until January 26th, 2017. They also added the Kid Icarus Uprising animated shorts for 100 platinum points each in North America and 80 platinum points in Japan. This offer was only for a limited time up until June 24th, 2017. There was another discount made available for Uprising. This time it was a 50% discount for a limited time up until January 1st, 2020. Super Kid Icarus was a rumor NES game that was a sequel to the NES Kid Icarus. I was going to go over this topic, but if you want to learn more about it, just check out L Super Sonic Q's video on it. I feel like he did a better job explaining this topic. Topic. So check out this video if you want to learn more about it. I mean, he really did a good job on it. Still on the topic of Super Kid Icarus, there is a fan-made game of Super Kid Icarus. The game itself is not really a sequel. It was basically a 16-bit remake of the first Kid Icarus. It was released on Flip Industries' website, but it can't be played anymore due to Adobe Flash no longer running. Since Adobe Flash is no longer running, they will try to port it to JavaScript. As of right now making this video, the fan-made game is still not up yet. In Electronic Gaming Monthly, issue number 92, page 28, released in March of 1997, it states that a Kid Icarus 64 and Metro 64 were going to be released within a year or two, but both games, unfortunately, never saw the light of day. And it's most likely a fake rumor. According to a Techland interview with Masahiro Sakurai, Kid Icarus Uprising was going to be a brand new Star Fox game. Here's a quote from the interview on the reason why he didn't show Star Fox. But the problem with Star Fox was that, and you'll see this when you see the trailer for Kid Icarus, is that the game design incorporates a lot of different views. For example, flying and shooting sideways, or turning around and shooting behind, and I felt like there were some restrictions with Star Fox in this regard. With Pit, there's a certain amount of flexibility that is allowed and makes a better fit for this gameplay. In a Iwata ass interview with Masahiro Sakurai, the development of Uprising first started off on the PC and then later on the Wii. The reason for this is because they didn't have a 3DS development kit during that time. In Together Mode, if there isn't enough players online, the CPU bots will be added and the name of the bots will either be given a random username, a name of a character or enemy from Kid Icarus, or a reference to other Nintendo characters. Factor 5 were known for working on Star Wars Squadron series and a Turk series. By March of 2007, Nintendo contacted Factor 5 to make a brand new 3D Kid Icarus game with approval of Creative Freedom. The name of this new project was called Icarus. After researching on Kid Icarus, Factor 5's development team wanted the dirt game to be more mature than the previous two installments. The story would have been Pit being banished from Sky World after being accused of crimes against Sky World. Many years later, Pit is now a full-grown adult now and he can fly now. Due to many years of training and protecting the overworld, a new threat attacks the overworld and Pit must stop it, as well as hoping that he could redeem himself 
himself in some way from getting back to Skyworld. Nintendo sent their pit redesign from Super Smash Bros. Brawl, but Factor 5 decided to make a brand new design for pit. This ranges from a traditional Greek inspired hero attire, a dark emo fallen angel attire, <coughs> dark pit, <coughs> pit two. a white robe like attire. Not only that, they also might have given him a demonic arm with dark magic, broken shackles, scars, or tattoos, possibly representing his crimes against Skyworld. Quote unquote final redesign of pit was a mixture of being Nintendo's pit and Factor 5's pit, alongside with a redesign of Palutena's bow. The game itself would use the Lair engine from Factor 5's previous game, Lair. The engine would have run in 60 frames per second and show a lot of objects on screen. The gameplay would have used the Wii Nunchuck to move Pit around and the Wii Remote to aim. The player can freely make Pit fly whenever you want, switching from air battles to land battles while collecting orbs scattered across each level. And you would have encountered redesigns of enemies like bats and netlers. On March of 2008, Factor 5 presented the project to Nintendo executives and they rejected it, thus ending the project for good. This is what one of the former Factor 5 animators, Joe Spataro, had to say in an interview. With Icarus, I feel like we're missing the point. Nintendo sent us the model of Kid Icarus, very much like the one that appears in Smash Brothers, but we didn't use it. We made our own version. It was more mature, maybe even a little dark. It felt like more like Devil May Cry. I knew Nintendo would never go for the adult version of Pit. In fact, I'll wager they took it as an insult that we didn't use their version. What I'm about to say is a hot take. As much as I like Uprising, I kind of want this game to be made instead. I'm not gonna lie. Some of these redesigns for Pit look really good, especially these. The story itself sounds way more interesting than the one in Uprising. Able to fly from land battle to air battle? That sounds pretty interesting. I don't even mind a dark edgy reboot. I think this looks great. If Uprising didn't came out and we got this instead, I will be okay with it. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah, I hear it. Yep. There it goes. Here comes the boos. Here comes the dislikes. Yeah, I, I know. I, I know. I know a lot of people are not going to agree with me, and that's okay. This is only my opinion. And besides, what does it matter? At least Uprising was made, and now we wait for a sequel or a remake. Only time will tell. In the first Kid Icarus game, there was an enemy called Rockman. Rockman? Am I pronouncing that right? Ah, screw it. I'm calling him Rockman. This enemy only appears in the overworld. It will drop down from the sky and try to hurt you. In Uprising, there's a boss character called Crankalanche. One of his moves consists of him falling from the sky and trying to hurt you. Well, not really falling from the sky, more like levitating above you and slamming to the ground. It's possible that Crankalanche might be a rock man, but more evolved. Both enemies are rock-like creatures and have similar attack patterns. The more I look at these two, the more I think these creatures were rejected Pokemon characters. There were unknown trophy facts that people seem to forgot about, or they were too lazy to read that I want to still talk about. Twin Bellows used to be smaller until Medusa used her magic to make him big. Have you seen Twin Bellows in the original game? He was about the size of two German Shepherds. Bossworth wasn't even going full power during the fight with Pit. Makes you wonder how strong is she? Has anybody noticed that Pyron is the only god to be in quotes? None of the other gods have this. The more you think about it, I kind of find this quite humorous. I like how the other gods just accepted him as the sun god because he told him he was one of them without any evidence. As far as I know, Pyro might be some random ass dude, let alone a possibility being human with fire powers. Is being God in that universe that easy? All I had to do was just make some random thing up? I can say I'm the God of eating ass, and they'll still believe me. Besides the point, let's move on. The Arm Cruiser is not really a ship at all. The Chaos Can might be stronger than the gods themselves, but it's weak to an electrical trap, and it's the only enemy that works on it. Are you sure this thing is more stronger than the gods? That's like saying you survive countless wars, getting stabbed and shot multiple times, only to die because you slipped on a banana peel. Humans only see Ethel Rings as a pile of rocks due to his heavily status. My best guess is heavily magic. I mean, what else can it be? The Royal Blade once belonged to an unknown wealthy family that is long past dead. The Samurai Blade is a copy of an unknown legendary sword. Which sword? How the hell shall I know? Ancient Staff was made by a lost and dead civilization. Somewhat Staff is more like a blade in a staff. And the Staff is also a sentient creature. Stove Claws were forced in darkness and it's in mummy bandages. The Shock Orbitars are rendered useless unless Pit's wings start flapping. Nettlers were once slugs until they evolved. Monowise evolve into Ganymades. The crawler's weak spot is his heart, located on his back. Sirens act like and should be renamed to Harpies instead. Due to their win abilities, Sirens in Greek mythology lack win abilities. Instead, they try to seduce men to their deaths. Ors are living creatures made by misery and regret. According to unknown laws of gravity, there is no way a monolith should be able to levitate. Its huge metallic structure is too heavy to move off the ground. The monolith, of course, floats anyway. Because monoliths do not care what gods think, it's impossible. Oh, and it teleports underworld troops. Splint is a floating nucleus that's on top of the food chain. If it's sitting on top of the food chain, we should rename this enemy to Mitochondria because it's a powerhouse. Vecnose doesn't have hair, it has tentacles. Fireworm isn't really a worm. It's a huge skeletal dragon fueled by jealousy and rage from others. Sheldon's only purpose in life is to protect others. What a crappy way to live and die for. Baba Ganoush is a Levantine appetizer that originated from Lebanon. It consists of roasted eggplant that is either baked or broiled over a open flame. This will give the roasted eggplant a soft but smoky taste to it. Once the eggplant is good and roasted, mix in all 
olive oil, lemon juice, seasonings, and then add tahini. The word baba ganoush means spoiled old daddy or flirtatious daddy. Mangu's source of heat comes from its brain, but it's dumb as hell. Grin is like the description says, a hyper-evolved antlion. Antlions in real life are classified as part of the new Octrian family, also known as the Miron not to die. I know I butchered that word, I'm so sorry. But anyway, there are over 2,000 species in the group. They live all parts of the world, but each one looks different, depending on the region. Leex is part lion and motorcycle. Petri bombers don't have feet. Instead, they have four hands. Sometimes when they throw a bomb, they'll lose their balance, leading them to blowing up themselves up. Sinistu is an underworld genie that will drag its victims to its pot, to a one-dimensional universe, to almost never to be seen again. Frosty the snowman reference. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Rosum are sometimes kept as pets, and in warm places or during the summertime, they are used as air conditioners. The only reason Plutons are in the underworld army is due to their power, excusing them of all their crimes due to this. Forge Oink was supposed to transport enemies to the battlefield, but due to some mistakes, they shoot their allies instead of ammo. The Space Pirate's armor is actually their exoskeleton. Brady created Nutski by removing its chestnut from its shell and giving it life. Dirts were given their electricity powers when they get struck by lightning. Toxic Cap is actually an engineered bioweapon. It's implied that Captain Flare is from an alternate universe. Supli's real eye is the red orb on its head. The Speed Boots resembles Hermes' boots, Teleria. If you think that was obscure and interesting, we were given more lore information to the Kid Icarus universe, some of which are only mentioned in the idol section of the game. There's acknowledgement of existence of other gods, such as Eros or Cupid, and can't to which lightning gods, thunder gods, and Egyptian gods. Not only there were other gods in this said universe, there's also unknown places and other mythological creatures. Mount Olympus in an unknown forest does exist according to the description of the crystal bow and perhaps the ore club. I wasn't really sure about the ore club description, but I might give it a pass. The description for the Babel club states that there's a tower that hosts the wrath of the heavens. The existence of the Tower of Babel, Titans, and civilizations such as ogres and fairies. The most crazy out of description must go to the raptor claws. Not only the raptor claws gave us information about the weapon, but it confirms the existence of dinosaurs, Christianity, and oh yeah, Jesus effing Christ. Jesus Christ exists in the Kid Icarus universe. How do I know this? What does BC stand for? It stands for before Christ. I can't believe the Bible is a prequel spinoff of Kid Icarus. Wait, can I actually say that Jesus Christ is my favorite Kid Icarus character? So the next time you pick up the Bible, just remember, you're reading the lore of Kid Icarus. And if you're reading it in public, just say you're a Kid Icarus fan and it will completely understand. Oh yeah, one other thing. Palatina sucks at being a military commander. How the hell was Skyworld not taken or the Overworld being taken by the Underworld army before Pit arrived is beyond me. Am I the only one to question on why Medusa doesn't turn Palatina into stone? I mean, she never did in the first game. She just imprisoned her in the palace in the sky. If she can turn all of the centurions and angels into stone, why not her? Just turn her into stone, kick her, and boom. The only two times Palatina was petrified was in Myths and Monsters by Orcos and the Chaos Cannon Uprising. Many Kid Icarus fans, including myself, have theorized the identity of the Cherry Master. The first person comes to mind is Hercules, or Hercules, depending on how you want to pronounce it. There are two reasons on why it cannot be him. Number one, the Cherry Master mentioned the loss of his master. If it was Hercules, then where is Zeus then? Zeus is basically the king of all gods, a grim mythology, and he's immortal. Well, then again, Palatina does mention something about God's lifespan in chapter 14, but it was only mentioned for a brief second. The second reason is because of Magmus, due to him being human with overwhelming strength. That's never been explained, so he might be this in-game universe of Hercules. After doing some research, I think I know who it might be. The second candidate on who the Terry Master might be is Achilles. He was in many countless wars. To who my master might be, it's either Chiron, a senator who Polybius entrusts to train with, with to train him at a young age, until he became into a full-grown adult. The second choice could be Zeus. Why Zeus, you may ask? Well, it's because both Zeus and Poseidon wanted to marry Thetis. But Prometheus or Themis, depending on the adaptation of the story, told Zeus that Thetis will bear a son greater than his father. For this reason, the two gods withdrew their pursuit and had her wed to Peleus. Perhaps Zeus trained him, and since he became a powerful warrior, just like the prophecy says, he now guards the lightning chariot base and gained the power of lightning. The last choice could be Peleus, Achilles' father. He had two immortal horses, Thalius and Xanthus, given by Poseidon as a wedding gift. Those two horses were later given to Achilles, during the Trojan War. Now, doesn't these two horses remind you of Faust and Lux? And not to mention the Cherry Master is, well, riding a chariot and wearing armor that was worn during the Trojan War, which is similar to Achilles' armor. In Darius Phrygius, History of the Fall of Troy, he written down a description of Achilles, and I quote, Achilles had a large chest,
chest, a fine mouth, and powerfully formed arms and legs. His head was covered with long, wavy, chestnut colored hair. Though mild in manner, he was very fierce in battle. His face showed the joy of a man richly endowed. Achilles also went by many nicknames, like Pyrusu, I Decide, Aimonius, Espedos, Lorisius, the Dryan, Noreus, Elodes, Bias, and Podarchus. There is this one piece of evidence that proves that he's Achilles. Achilles died when Paris shot him with a poison arrow in his left heel. His one true weakness, since, since his mother Thetis was holding him by his left heel and dipped him in a river of sticks when he was an infant, making him somewhat immortal. Only his left heel was undipped. Once again, his only weakness. If you look very closely at his character model, all of his body parts seems to be proportional in length, except for his left leg. Not only that, his left heel is exposed. The armor he has right now is what he looked like before his death and was carried over when he became a spirit to be reminded of that day. And now for a far out theory. Well, I have one more theory on who the Cherry Master might be. It's not a theory of my own, but I remember seeing his comment while we were watching Sugar Conroy's Let's Play of Kid Icarus Uprising. This theory was made by Sega360, and I quote, On a more serious note, I have a theory as who the Cherry Master is. First, let's go over what we know. He went by many names. He had a master who would do anything for. He had comrades in arm whom he says have returned to dust. His master died. He has the three vehicles of the gods, and it almost seems like he let Pitt win. Out of all those things I just listed, what sounds like what would describe Pitt? He looks similar to Cupid in Of Myths and Monsters. He was also called Icarus in his first adventure, and his official name is Pitt. Playing through this game, you can see that he not only loves and believes the best in Lady Palatina, but he also seems to be willing to do anything for her. Moments where he nearly dies. His soldiers, the Centurions, whom Pitt was very against, being dragged into the fight with the Aurum. Seems to be more like brothers rather than soldiers to Pitt. They are also turned to stone in his first adventure. As anyone knows with a statue, all you need is enough time and they will turn to dust. Pitt also really likes using the vehicles of the gods, and if he could, he will probably keep them somewhere. And for anyone who doesn't know, Nintendo has a tendency to bring time travel into their games. And with something like the Lightning Chariot going through space, time travel could definitely be possible. Now to get to the actual theory. The Cherry Master is a possible future outcome of who Pitt could have become. I already made connections to the two characters. Now I elaborate on the theory itself. I say possible outcome because of the events after retrieving the Lightning Chariot, after defeating the Chaos Kin, at the end of Chapter 20, and rips Palutena's souls out to later consume it. This Chariot Master most likely met with the terrible fate of failing to save her soul in time. Now for the holes in this theory. If the Cherry Master was Pit, how did he get the Chariot? Who to say there was a Cherry Master during the first Pit time around? If this theory was proven true, and then the Cherry Master line of I have no regrets makes no sense, since he should have regretted not saving his master in the first place. Actually, it still does. Not only does he leave his now decayed shell, knowing his successor was strong, but he also got to see how strong his time remnant self truly is, renewing his confidence that his future could be prevented from becoming Pits. This would explain why the tower was so tall, its design, and why Veridi couldn't land Pit closer to the top. At some point, the Terran Master had mastered something similar to what Pyron used to keep Palutena from pulling Pit out of the battle. But this interference, rather than stopping the god from pulling anything out there, prevents any godlike force from sending any living organism or divine beings from being sent to the top. He wanted to see if Pit could endure his trial. But hey, it's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for reading. So what do you think? Do you think it's possible? Or is there anything else I'm missing? That's basically his entire theory. I was originally not supposed to put this in, but the theory itself is quite interesting. So I had to put it in. But is this theory true? It's not like it did the characters mention any time travel or something. Let's say like the multiverse, right? Right? Link's actions as the hero of time created parallel worlds, and from there, many different legends were born. If you were defeated by Medusa, Palutena wouldn't be here today, right? We may have triumphed over Medusa in this timeline, but in a different timeline, you lost that fight, leaving Medusa and Hades to rule the world. Every action and inaction creates infinite parallel worlds. You're only in one of them. Wait, I'm not the only me? And nothing I do matters because another me will do the opposite? Then what's the point of doing anything? Well, shit. In a Wada ass interview, Sakurai said in that interview that a mascot like character would have accompanied Pit during the game, but decided to drop that concept in favor of the Pit and Palutena duo that we all know and love. There were three unused chapters. Looking at these screenshots, it wouldn't take place in a snowy mountain area with chubby cat like creatures. Not sure if they're going to be enemies or not. A unknown town and a golden town or city taking place at night. The reason for these chapters being dropped are unknown. Maybe the developers didn't have time to finish it, or they didn't have any ideas for these chapters. Toast Company Limited or Toast Software are ghost 
ghost developers that worked on the first two Kid Icarus games. You may be wondering, what's a ghost developer? It's when someone develops code for a product, but they don't get credit for it. Toast was founded in November of 1979. In 1980, the company would have helped develop Sasuke vs. Commander arcade machines. And in 1981, they helped develop Vanguard Overseas arcade machines. In August of 1982, they began to work on video game software. And in April of 1984, they began to develop video game software for the Famicom system. And the rest was history. Here are some games they developed over the years. Mappy Land, Dragon Ball Z Hyper Dimension, Tetris 2, Yoshi's Cookies, The Legendary Starfy Series, Metal Gear Ghost Baffle, Super Princess Peach, Fire Emblem Fates, Paper Mario Color Splash, Famicom Detective Club The Missing Air Remake, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, WarioWare Get It Together, and Shrek Wrecking Havoc. I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's Shrek. I mean, who doesn't love Shrek? I like Shrek. So anyway, um, yeah, Shrek. Masa Agarita, the Vice President of Toast Software USA, Boichi Sawada, the Director of China Sales for Toast USA, and Sugeru Chikusa, the President and Director of Toast Software Shanghai, were interviewed with Gamma Sutra, or now known as Game Developer, and here's what he had to say in the interview. Why don't you push for more games like Starfy to come out in the US? It was a good game. We almost never put our name on our product, so we're always behind the scenes. I guess that's why. How come we never heard of you until now? Well, we're based in Kyoto, right? So we're ninjas. You can't find us. But in the past 26 years, we worked on 1,100 games, including partial games. Even Starfy? That was a Nintendo IP, and you made it. Starfy is a little bit different. It's the first one where we owned the IP. Actually, we shared the IP with Nintendo. We worked together to create the game from scratch. Do you feel like your staff ever gets frustrated not getting credit? No, I don't think so. We're just happy to hide ourselves. It's very much treated like a regular job, I guess. Not so much for personal recognition. That's right. Other developers treat it like it's real work too, though. And it's true that some people want their name on the staff role so they can present it as part of a portfolio when they move to other companies. But we have a very low turnover rate. They tend to stay with the company. How do people find about you if you're so behind the scenes? It's a sort of word by mouth for developer culture? Yes. In Japan, Toast is very well known among developers. We're trying to expand our presence in the US and Europe too. It's interesting that you wouldn't want to have your own portfolio known. Is that part of the contract that you don't want to save your names? Or is it a choice? Well, some publishers tell us not to say anything about our work. And for confidentiality reasons, we don't want to reveal our own information to anybody. So publishers take the credit themselves. And you only reveal the parts of your own portfolio when you're trying to get work. It depends. Oh, it says you have a pledge to never become a publisher. That's right. There's more to the interview as well as another interview with Game Developer. The link will be in the description below if you want to read the rest of the full articles. By the year 2010, Toast published its first game being Tsusume Tactics for the PSP. Despite saying they won't be a publisher, Toast Software does have a website. But to be honest, something about this website looks bare bones. If that's the word to describe it. I don't know. It's just Something feels off about this website. I feel like something is like missing or something. I don't know. Something about it does not sit well with me. I don't know what or why. It's just one of those gut feelings, you know? Oh, and one more thing. They misspelled Famicom on their website. Like I mentioned before, Project Sora was a collaboration between Nintendo and Sora Limited that was established in January 22nd, 2009. In order to develop this new project, with over 200 million yen to start the company with Nintendo, having 72% of the shares and the rest of the 28% ownership were from Sora Limited and other freelancers. On February 18th, 18, 2009, Nintendo announced the name and the formation of Project Sora, being a subsidiary group with Masahiro Sakurai serving as the company's president and director of the upcoming project during that time. The development of the game started on March of 2009, with only 30 people working on the game, and it was the first game to be developed for the 3DS. Afterwards, the rest was history. After the success of Kid Icarus Uprising being the only game developed by Project Sora, on June 30th, 2012, the official Project Sora website announced that the company was no more. The website was still up, up until July 31st, 2012. The only way to access the website is by using the Wayback Machine. Here's what I found on the website. In the early days of the website, it listed the types of positions the company was looking for. The application requirements, employment status, the contract is renewed every six months, up until the project ends within two or three years. The work day and startup date, grants, there was overtime allowances and bonus paid twice a year. The welfare covers full payment of transportation expenses, various social insurance, free employment support, retirement allowance, condolences money, child care slash nursing leave system, and so much more. Working hours start from 10 a.m. to 6.45 p.m. with having one hour for lunch. Holidays with pay vacation included. The application method is to be contacted by email one month from sending the work application. This is their recruitment process if someone was applying for the job position of their choice. This is how the process goes. Here's are the steps in order. Apply for the job position. Wait for one month after sending the job application. The beginning of the first interview. Then afterwards, you'll be notified by email to move on to the second interview. But you have to wait for one week. But I mean, that's if you get the second job interview. If not, it is what it is. The same thing happens for the second job interview. After the second job interview, you'll be moved on to the final decision and once again be notified by email. The main page details interviews with Sakurai and Iwata. There are four tabs on the left side of the website that the Wayback Machine has. The first tab was the company profile, like the company's name, the day it was founded, investments, directors, auditors, and the company's location. The second tab has part of the map where the company was located. The 
The third tab is the employment hiring process. The fourth and fifth tab are called special dialogue, volume one and two. It's just basically more interviews with Sakurai and Iwata. On the final day of the website, the only two things remain was a link to the special dialogue, volume two, and the Japanese website for Kitagur's Uprising until it was shut down for good. I really hope this changes soon, but for now, let's speculate on the reason why there's still no port to the Switch or a sequel. Masahiro Sakurai's official Twitter tweeted this, and I quote, We have received many requests for a sequel and remakes, but it will be difficult. But why though? I might have eight reasons for the lack of a port to the Nintendo Switch. Reason number one, changing the controls and remapping the buttons for the game. Reason number two, redubbing the lines. Remember in the tutorial of the game, they mentioned the 3DS a couple of times. That needs to be changed if it gets ported to the Switch. Reason number three, getting the original voice actors back to redub the lines for both English and Japanese. I remember the English voice actress for Palutena got replaced in Smash Brothers. The same thing happened with Viridis and Magvis voice actors. Reason number four, remaking the game from the ground up in HD. Reason number cinco, you know damn well that the online multiplayer will be part of the Nintendo Switch Online expansion pack. And when they do this, what I mean by this is that then the online will be shit. Get ready to experience a bunch of lag. Reason numero seis, they might add more content to the game, like the three scrap chapters, remix music, more weapons, and so on. Reason number seven, reworking on the weapons gems because there's no street pass for the Switch. Reason number eight, Nintendo may not feel comfortable without the help of Sakurai, since, you know, he was the director of the game, the company's president of Project Sora, and as well as Sora's Limited. As for the lack of a sequel, maybe they don't have any ideas. But I mean, come on. It's Greek mythology. They can pull anything from it. Just look at God of War, for example. For my dream sequel, make it an open world game. Switching from land battle to air battle in an instant. Add more gods, both returning and new. Make weapons with the ability to upgrade them. And maybe make Oracles the main villain of the game. Or have some other villain. In the fourth layer, I mentioned Zeus being nowhere to be seen in the Kid Icarus series. I will now go more depth into it. Zeus' role in the first game was that he put Pit in one of his trials. To see if he was worthy of the Sacred Bow, Fire Arrow, and the Protective Crystal. In the second game, if you score high enough in any level of the game, Game, he will increase your health. His physical appearance went from a bald man with a brown mustache and beard, as well as wearing a white robe to white hair on the side of his head with a mustache, along with wings and a halo. You could say that Lord Dentos is Zeus, since both of them are old. They both put Pit in trials and create weapons to help Pit on his quest. But there's three problems with this theory. If Lord Dentos is Zeus, how come Pit and Palatina doesn't acknowledge his help in the first two games? Zeus wasn't given that name. It turns out that this name Zeus was given to this character due to a Western localization change. This was never the official name. Even though it's stated that Lord Dentos is powerful beyond imagination, he's most likely based on the god of blacksmiths, Hephaestus. Even though Zeus doesn't appear in Uprising, Poseidon, Medusa, and Hades are in it. Why does this matter? Well, all three of them are from Greek mythology. Poseidon and Hades are Zeus's brothers, meaning that perhaps Zeus does exist in Kid Icarus universe. In the outer description for the Thundercloud Temple, it reads this, an electrical charged temple located in a storm. Although it's a perfect match for Phosphora, she's only a recent resident. The actual founder and original inhabitant of the Thunder Cloud Temple was a thunder god. This is very strong evidence that this could be Zeus's old home or headquarters. When Palutena mentions that the Thunder Cloud Temple was abandoned since ancient times, that's the part I don't understand. If it was Zeus's domain, she could have just said Zeus's temple. In the Japanese version of Kitagura's Uprising, the angel bow was called Cupid's God Bow. In the international release, it's implied that the angel bow belongs to Cupid. Why am I telling you this? If they can go out of their way and mention that the angel bow belongs to Cupid, why couldn't it be the same thing for the Thunder Cloud Temple belonging to Zeus? This could mean that Palutena is still young for a goddess. She was probably wasn't even born during that time. She probably just read it from a book or just heard from someone. But wait, isn't Palutena based on Athena? Shouldn't she be Zeus's daughter, like in Greek mythology, and probably be aware of him? That part, I'm simply not that certain. But it could be possible. The only one who I'm certainly knows about the whereabouts of the owner of the Thundercloud Temple might be the Chariot Master. Okay, since he looks ancient, he's most certainly someone from ancient times. Obviously. And Palutena did mention that the temple was abandoned since ancient times. We can now imply that Zeus is an ancient god from the past. There might be three possible outcomes to this theory. One, Zeus does exist, but like Poseidon and Hades, they'd rather not interfere unless they have to. The second reason could be that since there is existence of galaxies, planets, and perhaps universes within the Kitagris universe, or some other unknown palace of the most powerful gods from other universes where they all meet up in one place. In a way, Zeus could be a protector of that said universe he's in. The third reason could be, well, either the Thundercloud Temple is from another unknown Thunder God, or Zeus is the owner of the temple, but his name is long forgotten, and perhaps forbidden to say. Poseidon is like a city filled with humans, due to hubris, envy, and deceit, and Hades wanted humans to kill each other to collect their souls for his army. Is it possible that Zeus went mad with power? In Greek mythology origin, Zeus hated humans and went mad with power. Remember, 
Palutena cares about human beings, unlike Zeus. The only gods that rebelled against him were Hera, Poseidon, and Athena, but they failed. To apply this into Kid Icarus universe, perhaps there was an all-out war against Zeus, and there were many casualties, including humans, titans, and other living creatures, and even gods. But wait, gods can't truly die, they can just bring them back to life. Well, that's where you're wrong. It's already proven that gods can be resurrected, but there is a way to kill a god from existence. The only way to kill an immortal god is to stop worshipping and acknowledging that said god. You are probably thinking right now, wait, that's just stupid. No Greek god died because of that. Well, there has. Meet Pan, the god of the wild. In Greek mythology, around the years of 14 AD to 37 AD, when the Egyptian sailor named Thamus was trying to sail to Italy, he heard a voice that said, Thamus, are you there? When you reach Pelodes, take care to proclaim that the great god Pan is dead. Once he reached his destination, he spread the word of Pan's death. The cause of his death is still unknown, but he did truly died after the news spread about his death. Why did I mention those years? The spreading of the news of Pan's death occurred during the beginning of Christianity. After spreading the news of Pan's death, people were starting to realize that the Greek gods were not real, they were just myths. They now shifted over to someone else to acknowledge and worship, that being Jesus Christ. Could this be the reason why Zeus is not in any of the games? Simply because humans don't want to acknowledge him and worship him anymore? And perhaps the next generation of humans that survived the war probably forgot about him after his death. Without humans worshiping gods, gods don't exist. If you want more proof of this concept in the game, I want you to listen to this conversation with Viridian Pitt at the end of the game. The sea can be a real sad sometimes. Why do you care so much about them? Well. Of all living beings, humans are the only ones with heart. Ah, uh, not true. All living creatures have an essence that can be described as heart. The humans have faith and devotion. That's what I mean by heart. Only humans believe in gods. Only humans respect the gods. Only humans believe in gods. Only humans respect the gods. Sounds a lot like worshipping and acknowledging. You can't worship and acknowledge a god if they don't remember that said god. Better yet, if they don't exist at all. This is body and soul most likely turn into dust and vanish into thin air. But Mr. AIG, how come the other gods don't talk about Zeus or the events that happened? That's very quite simple. Once again, without the acknowledgement of Zeus, he won't come back. Why would a god tell the humans about him? Why would you want the king of all gods to come back? It's everyone's fair game. No god should be that powerful. And that everyone is the Zeus theory. Yes, I'm done. I'm done with this iceberg finally oh my god take care be safe have yourself a good night and i will see you back here again with your boy mr aig Oh, you're still here. Huh. Look, this is not a brand new layer. It's more like things I forgot to mention on certain topics in the iceberg, as well as brand new topics in each layer. Let's start off with the Skyworld layer. I forgot to talk about the story of Myths and Monsters. So here's the story of that game. Palutena had a bad dream in which Skyworld gets destroyed by an unknown evil force. She then asked a soothsayer about the dream. The soothsayer said that Skyworld will be destroyed by Orcos and his troops that appear from another world. She then calls Pit and told him about the dream. Pit is now tasked to retrieve the three sacred treasures from the fortress guardians stop orcos and save sky world once again for the promotion for the super mario brothers movie there was a website called super mario brothers plumbing if you click on the service area tab pass the captcha then click on queens on the map you will now hear sound effects and music from kid icarus <laughs> In the film, Mario was playing Kid Icarus on the NES in his room. In Masahiro Sakurai's YouTube channel, he talked about the game's concepts of Uprising. As a Kid Icarus fan, I highly recommend watching it. If you die in Chapter 22 and choose to come back, Pit's model will be swapped for Dark Pit's model. And needless to say, it's very out of character for him. But hey, at least I'm he's smiling. At the end of Chapter 2, Palutena reveals that Pit has no friends. Holy shit, he's just like me in real life! He's like me! He's like me! <laughs> He is such a relatable protagonist. Dark Pit has two defeated poses. This can be seen in chapters 5, 6, 13, and 21. Hot Springs were always a part of the series since the beginning, and all the way up to Uprising. It was used to recover your health. In chapter 21, this is the only time it shows up in the air battle section, and the last chapter to feature in it. In chapter 4, there is this purple poisonous hot spring. If you step in it, you will lose your health in the process. It's implied that this special hot spring replenishes monsters' health. This is the only time it appears in the series and in Uprising. Dark Pit and Magmus both serve as allies, bosses, and playable characters. If you fail to deal enough damage to Medusa in her first phase, you'll save this.
she keeps throwing stuff at me. Try using a special attack. You can build up your gauge faster by deflecting attacks. How do you stay so calm? Panic isn't good for a goddess's image. Now just focus and wait for an opening. There are unique entrances when starting each chapter. It is shown in chapter 6, 9, 14, 15, 16, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 25. When Panatene was absent in chapters 19 for 21 and Viridi takes over, you can see the door entrance change slightly to match Viridi's aesthetic. The door entrance is now covered in vines and thorns. In the tutorial and the opening, there is this one scene from a 3D CGI of Palatina. Or is it her character model? I I'm not really sure, but anyway, it kind of resembles this one scene from Phantom Souls Rising. I don't know why they put this in the opening and in the tutorial, because in the opening, it shows what happens in the game, and this never shows up in the main story. I don't know, Ever since I got this game and first played it, it always bothered me. Was this like a cut scene or... You know what? Never mind. I'll just move on to the next topic. One of Medusa's hair snakes is a reddish-orange color, while the others aren't. In Chapter 18, Pit and Palatina are murderers. Yes, I know their bodies were possessed, but still, the townspeople and the other towns nearby, they don't know that. Are they going to bring back the people they killed back to life? Yeah, I don't think so. So I guess everyone's favorite edgy angel is the lesser evil character of the series. Good job, it too. Oh yeah, by the way, I'm counting this as two topics in one, so yeah. Hades and Medusa are the only boss battles that are strictly to air battles. During the promotion for Uprising, a huge part of the story and characters like Dark Pit, Hades, Poseidon, and so on, were surprisingly not spoiled, since the promotion were heavily focused on Pit, Palatina, and Medusa. And which I have to say, good job on Nintendo for that part. If this came out today, you know damn well this will get leaked. And everybody on Twitter, and yes, I'm still calling it Twitter, somewhere out there is going to spoil the entire game. Don't deny it. You know it's true. In some instances, that the you game over Jingo won't play after dying. This only happens when a serious moment happens in game. This only happens in chapters 12, 17, 20, 21, and twice in 25. Here's another alternate pathway I forgot to show. In the beginning of chapter 18, you can move the circuit pad around to make the ring shake. Now for the reset bomb factory layer. In chapter 12, there is a large spherical object in the sky. This could possibly be the lunar sanctum. In the NES manual, colons are undead centurions that are now possessed by EOIs, now known as Phils. In the end of Missing Monsters, it goes so high up to the sky, so close to the sun, that he loses both of his wings. Look at that smug ass smile. He's proud of what he did. Bastard. This is a reference to the story of Icarus, in which Icarus' wax feather wings melted because he got too close to the sun and he fell to his death. 
The purple Hue Draw is the original Hue Draw from the first game, due to his dialogue after being defeated. So you finished off the others, eh? You know it! Then you've saved the best for last. Let's get down to business! Look how far you've come, Pit. I'm proud of you. Huh. You don't usually meet such nice bosses. Let's get you back. Ever since Super Smash Bros. Brawl, there was this unknown language on the platforms of Skyworld and in Palutena's Temple and Super Smash Bros. for Wii U. And this unknown language never appeared in the Kid Icarus series, only in Smash Bros. only. If I had to guess, if it's anything like the Hylian writing in the Hyrule Temple stage, it could translate to Super Smash Bros. Remember the water of life from the first two games? Well, this isn't water. It's actually Saki. In the Famicom Disc version, this is called the Saki of Life. And yes, we have a depiction of Pit being drunk. Pit, put it down. Put that drink down. You're underage. You're not supposed to be drinking. Put it down. Put it down. Down. In Phantom's Rising, one of the mono eyes hit itself in one of the gears. In Chapter 13, if you turn around, you can see where Pit crashed through to get inside the Lunar Sanctum. For the other cameos and references in other Nintendo games, I forgot to mention that there was a Kid Icarus theme for the Nintendo Badge Arcade, WarioWare Gold, WarioWare Twisted, and WarioWare DIY. Pit was one of the rumored characters alongside King DDD, Bowser, Meowth, Wario, Marth, and Peach in Super Smash Bros. 64. But that rumor turns out to be fake when it was revealed that Slippy, Peppy, and Falco were considered to be alternate costumes for Fox. When Dark Pit shows up in Wave 9 in Chapter 21, you can shoot him by accident or on purpose. This will cause Dark Pit to fire back at you. If you're not careful enough, this might kill you. Some characters' idols doesn't allow the camera to be looked underneath for obvious reasons. You know what I'm talking about. You know damn well on what I'm talking about. Now for the Thundercloud Temple. When talking about the Kid Icarus Uprising beta, I forgot to mention this video showing more beta footage of Uprising. Not only this beta footage was made for the PC and Wii, we got a glimpse of a beta Medusa redesign. Now, I'm not going to lie, the silhouette of Medusa looks creepy as hell. Very unsettling to say the least. On the topic of the AR cards, it turns out that the PAL version for the AR cards, they sometimes had to win on the top right corner and sometimes they don't look at these two ar cards on screen the same ar card but one has a wing but the other one doesn't there is more sakurai music commentaries such as dark pit steam being inspired by western music with some spanish acoustic guitar during the life versus dark multiplayer mode when one angel appears a quiet arrangement is played then another track is added when both angels appear on screen the reaper lines of sight was performed from a live recording the music in it will change constantly to match what goes on on screen this soundtrack also used a melody from the famicom disc version of kid icarus well actually two to be exact it's the reaper theme and the main title theme the boss fight themes were made in mind to encourage the player to keep on fighting to to win. The space pirate theme was a mixture of seafaring pirates and outer space in mind. Practice range theme has a light feeling and analog tone to it. At one point, it was going to be used for something else in the game, but they decided to keep it this way in the final version. They wanted to make sure the player doesn't get bored of listening to the lightning chariot bass theme and make sure that the player feels that this is where the chariot master lives. When comparing the Japanese and international version of Uprising, this scene only showed up in the Japanese version. <laughs> I found more unused dialogue for Uprising. Many birds, one boom! Now for the Reaper Valley Lair. In Chapter 24, Pit was thinking he was meeting the God of Snacks. I know many people say it's supposed to be like a pun or a joke, because I don't get it. On the side note, we now know there's a brand new God we haven't met, and that is the God of Snacks. Even though there's no such thing as the God of Snacks in Greek mythology origin, the closest thing to it is Demeter, the Greek goddess of the harvest. For the Kid Icarus merch, I forgot to mention the ticket to the festival that has the Kid Icarus Uprising float on it. There was a another Kid Icarus manga I forgot to mention. Kid Icarus, The Mirror of Palutena. This manga was found in Koro Koro magazine, and it has a fan-made English translation. Link in the description below. Here are some more Kid Icarus guidebooks. For the auto description facts, Pandora's Box. I'm pretty sure it's already explanatory. Pandora's Box in the game, and Pandora's Box in Green Mythology Origin. For the fairy Orbitars and Hedgehog Claws, they were referencing Nobby from The Legend of Zelda and Sonic the Hedgehog. Pitch showed up in an issue of the German Club Nintendo magazine in a two-page comic called Super Mario Die Bushirong. I am sorry if I butchered that word. It's celebrating Christmas with Mario, Luigi, 
Yoshi, Toad, Peach, Link, and Mega Man. Diary of a Wimpy Kid Icarus was a segment from the show Mad that ran on Cartoon Network in the early 2010s. If you can already tell, this is a parody of Diary of a Wimpy Kid and a bunch of video game characters, especially of course, Kid Icarus. In this parody segment, Kid and his best friend Kirby try to survive the first day in video game school. This is going to sound dumb, but I want you guys to think about this. Is it possible that the Kid Icarus series took some inspiration from Saint Seiya, Knights of the Zodiac? Both protagonists are 13 years old, well, technically, Pit was still a little kid in the first two games until he turned 13 years old in Uprising. The same thing can go for Seiya when he was 8 years old. He had to train for 5 years to get the Pegasus Cloth. They used special armor and weapons to power themselves up. Both endure trials to get their special weapons and armor. Zodiacs protect both their goddesses, in which both of them use staffs as their main weapon of choice. Athena and Palutena were both captured and imprisoned at some point. That is just the first two games, comparing it to Saint Seiya. I haven't even started talking about comparing Saint Seiya to Uprising. They both battle Hades, face their evil counterparts. You could say Pit and Dark Pit are brothers, just like Seiya and his other brothers. Both settings take place in modern times, in each perspective series. I'm counting the Kidigris setting as part of modern times. If you remember when I was mentioning that part in the iceberg. And last but not least, both series debuted in the same year, in 1986. Kidigris was released on December 19th, 1986. And the Saint Seiya the manga series was released on January 1st, 1986. And the anime series on October 11th, 1986. Now for the underworld layer. The reason why Pit can't fly on his own that coincide with the promotion of Uprising, Pit stated that he was fledgling. If you don't know what that means, it means that his wings are still developing. This is quite odd because Palutena in game says that his wings are quote unquote, his wings don't work right. Oh, real original. Like I haven't heard that one before. Not to mention, it's none of your business. So sorry. I didn't realize it was such a sensitive subject. Oh, don't worry about him. He's fine. His wings just don't work right. Hey, whose side are you on? Spoken like a true adopted mother. In the Japanese version, she stated that Pit's wings was a result of a birth defect. Pit could be molting due to Pit's wings balding, according to this conversation with Palutena. It looks like your wings are losing feathers, Pit. Huh, I didn't notice. I guess you're right. I wonder if your wings are going bald. Why would you even say that? Sorry, it just sort of slipped out. Here, if you just kind of push the other feathers over the bald spot... I am not doing a comb over! Now then, is the power of flight time limit a lie? Pit can only fly due to Viridis and Palutena's power of flight, and it only lasts for 5 minutes. But it's revealed that once Star Pit absorbs Pandoria, he gains unlimited power of flight. This begs the question, why doesn't Palutena or Viridi give Pit this power? Or better yet, why doesn't Palutena fix Pit's wings? Perhaps Pit wants to truly fly on his own without anyone fixing his wings. Believing one day it will start working on his own. Hold on, doesn't Pit's wings burn up once the 5 minutes are up? Well, yes. We do watch Pit's wings burn up, but I don't I don't think that could be the case. In chapter 21, Pit's wings burn up and he almost died. Is it possible that Pit's wings only burn up due to the force, or in this case he overdid it on the power of flight, not the past time limit? If the power of flight is unlimited, why doesn't Palutena tell Pit about it? The answer is quite simple. She might want to control him. Pit defeated Medusa and the Underworld Army as a kid by himself. She probably saw the potential in him and possibly overpowering the gods one day as a full-grown adult angel. Another theory could be that Pit might be a half-breed angel, half-human, half-angel, which could be another reason why Pit can't fly. My guess, he needs to be a pure-blooded angel to fly, similar to Hyantia's from Xenoblade Chronicles. But since we don't know who Pit's parents are, that's still up for debate. Is it possible that Pit's wings could serve as a life force for angels. Just like the wing theory I mentioned earlier, in chapter 17, Pit's wings do burn up a bit, but he's just fine. Well, mine is him almost falling to his death, of course. At the end of chapter 21, Pit's wings do burn up, and it was almost completely gone. On top of that, he almost died. This could explain why Pit has been revived so many times after he dies, ever since the first game. I fight to win. In your past adventures, the underworld was where you died the most, right? Oh, absolutely. The difficulty level was just brutal. Does anybody notice, besides Dark Pit, we still haven't seen any other angels, not even in a flashback. There are angels being depicted in the NES manual, but for some reason, they lack wings. It makes you wonder, what do the other angels look like? Alright, 
I'm done. That's everything I want to talk about. Hopefully I didn't miss any that I need to say in the video. Thank you so much for making it this far into the video. I am so deeply sorry that this iceberg video took over two years to make. There are four reasons on why it took so long. For starters, I found more information I wanted to put in the video. Second, the previous recordings weren't all that good. It lacked confidence, or should I say, I didn't have much confidence in myself while recording them. Third, my previous mics, they sucked. The quality wasn't all that good. And fourth, life just happens. Personal stuff got in the way and life sucks sometimes, you know? Well, other times it's great. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. The link to the sources of the stuff I used in the video will be in the description below. Please check them out. Well, that's pretty much it. Thank you for watching. Take care. Be safe. Have yourself a good night. And I will see you back here again with your boy, Mr. AIG. So here's to the Kid Icarus Iceberg, my longest and greatest accomplishment for now at least. Mr. AIG out.